Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you are well on this uh, fine Tuesday evening. I, um, I'll be starting the session all in about 60 seconds, but I just want to do a little bit of formalities as always. So uh, my name is Alexander Leach. For those who weren't on the session yesterday, um, I am the Senior Education Manager for the Middle East, based in Dubai, and I will be taking you for the remainder of our practice to pass strategic business leader sessions for the remaining four evenings. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. I do have my fingers crossed that you can. Um, but just to confirm, if you would be so kind as to put a little yes or a why or even a hello in the question panel. Um, thank you very much. I'll have a little look and hopefully we're ready to go. And splendid. I can see them all rushing. I can see some familiar names as well, which is always really good. Um, it's, it's very reassuring to know that people who were on last night have come on again this evening as well. Hopefully you, um, you found last night useful and um, you'll find even tonight and the remainder of the course even more useful. We're going to take a little bit of a sort of change in direction this evening and be very exam specifically focused. So whereas last night we talked about the structure of the exam and the syllabus from a sort of high level broad point of view, this evening we're going to be taking a deep dive and a walk through one of the specimen exams, it's specifically specimen paper two and the name of the case study is Rail Curve. Thank you everyone who said yes, everyone's saying the audio is clear, so we will commence. I will just click through uh, our lovely PowerPoint as always, and uh, if you do have any technical issues, please just throw them into the question panel. Uh, we have technical support online as well, so they'll be able to help with anything in terms of sound or visuals. Uh, and if you have any questions about my presentation and the particulars of Strategic Business Leader, throw them in the question panel and on regular intermissions I will check that question panel and I can address them as we go along. Um, <clears throat> so we've done the welcome so we can tick that one off of the overview for this evening and we will be discussing specifically real curve. Now for those who were on last night you will be aware uh, that I asked you to read the, the actual exam of specimen paper two and if you have done that fantastic uh, if you haven't, you might put yourself at a little bit of a disadvantage, I'm going to be frank with you. Uh, well, I'm actually going to be Alex with you, terrible joke. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you, but it won't be the end of the world. You'll still find this evening useful, but it will help you if you can read the full thing before tomorrow as well, because we'll be using real Curve again tomorrow. My overall agenda for this evening is to give you an understanding of what the exams look like and where and how we find the information from the exhibits, how we dissect the requirements. We're going to be doing lots of active reading and then we're going to be doing some answer planning. In terms of the agenda last night, just to sort of make sure that we, we did do everything I said we did, we did the Ethics and Professional Skills module, or we did an overview of it, and I will again stress the necessity of doing that module. It's an online module, it's interactive, it can be used to fit around your learning, and it very much complements the strategic professional level, and even more so the strategic business leader exam. Uh, we talked about study tips, um, exam techniques, how to approach the SBL exam, and there was lots of ACCA online study support resources. And then we spent some time at the back end of the session talking more about the examiner's reports, and it was very encouraging to see you all in the question panel throwing in the, the common problems, the common weaknesses, and also, positively, the common strengths. So hopefully, because you engage with those examiner's reports, you won't be making those weak mistakes. You'll be doing the strong things, like structuring your answer, using the case, making sure you have a ruler so you can put subheadings, uh, not just throwing in superfluous waffle, and really making sure that you have a good go at this exam. Tonight, as I've said, and tomorrow, specimen paper two, real curve. So, this exam was um, published back in, I believe, September 2018, and it was one that I spent quite a lot of time when I was working at Kaplan using with students. It's one that I know very well, 
Um, and I'm hoping that I can impart some knowledge and some wisdom with you this evening on how to go about attacking any SBL case study and the key facts and the key features within the case study that will help you go through it. Now, we will start with the introduction. For anybody who's wondering where they find the case study, if you haven't already read it, we do have the handouts in this section on GoToWebinar. So it says RailCo S18 SBL Specimen Paper 2. <clears throat> if I'm being honest, it would have been easier if you'd have had it printed out. So those who do have it printed out, fantastic. And you can annotate it as we go along. You can highlight it. And we've also got this evening's presentation slides as well for those who want to reference those as well. So when you do pick up the, the booklet in the exam, this particular specimen paper is roughly around 14 pages long, uh, including the front pages, which uh, maybe is probably more accurate to say 12 pages. Um, you get the introduction, and I've had to, for the purposes of fitting it onto my presentation, split the introduction and a few of the other slides over the actual slide itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, or talk through even, the exam and realistically the approach you want to take. So you get the introduction, so this gives you a, a nice taste of what's to come, and I've highlighted out the key parts. So it's a public sector company, boom, and it works in the real industry. Um, just from that first line, I'm already thinking, right, rail travel, okay, it's a public sector organisation, so things from my studies and my experience, well, public sector organisations are more concerned with things like value for money, um, they've got broader stakeholders, so that might come into it as well, because the stakeholders potentially will be the taxpayers and the public of that company, or that country even, and they're based in Beeland. Now, ACCA, for those who haven't studied an exam or sat an exam with us before, we love to make up countries. So, Beeland is where this uh, company is based. Um, Railco is governed by the Supreme Governing Committee, known as the Railco Trust Board. The reason I highlight that is because it gives you an understanding of the structure of the organisation from the word go. And that will probably help you when understanding how the organisation structured itself from a corporate governance and a board of directors perspective. And you also get a lovely little diagram underneath ranging figure one, um, starting at the Railco Trust Board. So you know that that is the supreme governing body. Underneath that, the hierarchy goes into the board of directors. And then you've got an array of committees. So we've got an executive committee, um, a, a safety and health executive committee. We've got an audit and risk committee, a remuneration committee, and then a nomination and corporate governance committee. So immediately, I'm pulling out, it's a real company, it's based in Beeland, it's a public sector organisation, and it's got quite an interesting organisational structure. And for those who have studied quite a lot or are familiar with corporate governance, you will probably be thinking, oh, actually, the structure of it's quite typical um, of a hierarchy with those committees in there. Um, the board is responsible to the Ministry of Transport for ensuring that the Rail Co Board makes the best use of public money and maintains effective and efficient services. Underneath that diagram, we've got a little introduction now to the National Audit Authority, the NAA, which is the government's audit authority, and they're an important stakeholder within this case study, so I've, I've highlighted that. Uh, if I move through into the green, the NAA has the responsibility to advise on value for money. So while I was thinking about the public sector at the top of this page, I've then been reaffirmed that my understanding is correct and therefore my trail of thought is correct in terms of wanting to use the terms like value for money. And when I go to answer my questions, those are the types of key words that will really strengthen my answer. Moving on and looking at the blue, Railco has recently passed, um, start that again, Railco has in the recent past received negative publicity in the media for a variety of other sources relating to its poor service and performance. It's quite nice, again, that they give you a problem from the onset. Ultimately, and the stereotypical requirements, stereotypical case studies for all SBL exams are going to have one main problem, uh, maybe several smaller problems as they go along. You wouldn't be given a case study that is perfect because your job as strategic business leaders and as ACCA students is to try and show that you can fix the problems from a high level and a leadership perspective in a professional capacity within an organisation. 
So the problem is, is that they've got a negative perception in the media and their poor service and performance. So that's not good, particularly, and it rings alarm bells to me if they're spending taxpayers' public money. We've then got an array of exhibits. So hopefully you've had chance to have a little skim through these. Um, and I would take probably less than 60 seconds if I was reading this and learning the exam to just pull out these key parts. We've got a web page, we've got a newspaper, uh, we've got some performance analysis, we've got board minutes, that'll be quite an interesting read. We've got a summary of CVs and a job spec. And then also exhibit six, uh, we've got some analysis or we've got a, a spreadsheet even um, of data on fraud ticket sales and passenger usage, which has been prepared by a financial controller. So without even moving further into the actual scenario, you've already got a taste for it, and therefore you can use your prior knowledge and experience from your study, your actual knowledge maybe through working in, a, in an organization to get a good taste for what's coming. There are five requirements. Now, I'm not going to go through every requirement this evening. We will be splitting them over the course of two evenings. Um, and the, the requirements are very standardized. Now, we talked about active reading yesterday, and we're going to be doing that as we go along. So obviously, well, not obviously, but, but one of the first things you do is to look at the mark allocation. So question one's 18 marks. So I'd be working out the time I want to spend on that. Question two, that's 24 marks. And again, you use the rule of 1.8 minutes per mark for writing time, and that's based on technical and professional marks. And as I skim through these requirements, uh, requirement three, again, 18 marks, requirement four, 20 marks, and requirement five is 20 marks as well. Taking a slightly closer look at each exhibit. So there's an overview of the website, newspaper, uh, an extract. We've also got board meeting minutes, as I've said, chief executives, personal spec, and an analysis of fraud. What I would like to do now is actually do a bit of a sort of fun engagement. Hopefully you're able to buy into this because when you do, it really does work. Now, some of you might be familiar with Kahoot. I went to the trouble of making a quiz today um, and the quiz is to design to try and engage you. So get you involved while you're doing the online tuition and online lecture. So you'll need your mobile phone. You want to go to maybe a search browser, so Google works and type in Kahoot, K-A-H, Double O T dot I T. Out of interest, um, has anybody done any cahoots before or familiar with this? And if you have, throw it in on the uh, the actual, um, I was going to say chat panel, on the question panel, because I'll be able to see that and that'll be quite encouraging for me. <coughs> so what I'll do is um, I'll wait for you to actually go onto the cahoot. So you want to go onto your mobile phone or your tablet. If I just skip to the next page, you can use the, the actual tablet or mobile phone to engage with it. And when you do get onto the website, so that's kahoot.it, you'll be able to enter a game pin, which is what I'll move on to next. The way the actual game works is very interactive. So once you've entered the game pin, which I will be giving you shortly, your mobile phone or tablet becomes effectively, or even your laptop, becomes effectively like a control panel. Hopefully you'll have seen something familiar like um, who wants to be a millionaire? Oh, fantastic. Abdul Qadir, you've used this before, so you'll be an expert. I'm hoping for good things from you. So the tablet or your mobile phone or your actual laptop or computer becomes very much like a who wants to be a millionaire game pad where they ask the audience um, and you're able to try and answer the questions corresponding to the colors with the answers on the screen. <coughs> so hopefully many of you are engaging with this, which is fantastic. I'm going to now set the quiz up and show you the game pin. So I'm just going to exit this. I'm going to go onto my browser uh, and I am going to click on play here. Uh, I'm going to play the uh, standard game, so hopefully this one, this hopefully the IT system will work quite nicely, and you'll probably hear a little bit of a song through the microphone as well. Here we are. So what you guys need to do is enter the game pin, which is one nine one zero five one, and then type in your actual name or nickname. So Ivan, I can see you're engaging already. Fantastic. I'm hoping for quite a few of you because on tonight's session we've got around. 
got around 100 people. So I'm thinking at least half of you want to get on here. So I'm going to hold off for probably at least 60 to sec to 60 seconds to two minutes. Ah, oh, you're all you're all flying in now. Um, for those who haven't played it before, please do get involved. It is a really fun way of engaging with the actual class, and it's a really fun way of engaging with the case study as well. It's quite competitive, which we use the term called gamification, and people do get quite a lot out of this as well. Good to see some people popping in. Thanks, Jack. Cheers, Dasu, Anu, uh, Mav, Siri. I can see a lot of you on there. Who else have we got on there? Hi, Kenny. Um, oh, fantastic. Look how many names we've got here. This is this could be the biggest Kahoot we've done at ACCA. So come on, let's make it one to be proud of. I'm hoping for a few more players. So if you're currently having IT issues, come on, let's do a quick refresh on that mobile phone. Um, and if you do so happen to not get in on it, it's not the end of the world, but you can play along as we go along. So... Oh, Sammy's in. Come on, give me one, one or two more. Laura, a couple of dropping out. So that's not always the best. All right. We might have reached our optimum level here with around 40. So while we do that, I'm going to click start. So here we go. So the questions pop up on screen and your mobile phone or tablet corresponds to a color. That is the necessary answer. This one's a true or false. So Railco is a public sector organization. Red would be false and blue would be true. Outstanding. I can see 40 of you answered already. There's maybe a couple of stragglers. <coughs> Excuse me. Five seconds to go, guys. No pressure. Brilliant. 43 of you got it right. One of you got it wrong, but I'm assuming that that person who got it wrong was probably a little slip of the finger. Uh, Leeds. Woohoo! I, I like that. I'm actually, I lived in Leeds for. Uh, for for over four years, so um, <laughs> I quite like the use of that. Maybe it's your name, maybe it's where you're from. Um, you answered that in probably less than a second. You scored 90, 988. For all of those um, who haven't played this before, the faster you answer, the higher the score. So what's really good about this is actually that you can get significantly high points on this. This one's uh, a multiple choice. A public sector organisation like Railco should focus on something of a profit. Red is shareholder wealth maximization, blue is value for money, orange is minimizing spending, and green is tax avoidance. Oh, superb. We've got over 50 answers, which means more people are logging on. Outstanding. <coughs> and I'll tell you what, that's quite remarkably impressive value for money i wasn't sure if anybody would have actually hooked on to my little little push towards that earlier so well done the 46 of you abdul you are winning by a, a, a hair uh Far furkan well done my man um really really impressive so we'll keep going through now uh, in the context of the case what does NAA stand for we've got the national advisory agency in red uh, in blue, New Age Auditors. In orange, not another accountant. And in green, the National Audit Authority. Oh, a nice split there. So 35 of you got with National Audit Authority. I'm not sure who went for not another accountant. That was a little bit of a tongue in cheek joke. Um, so well done for the 35 of you went for green. Abdul's back on top, um, but the top five are still looking consistent. Well done, Kit there in fifth. Or oh, kick even. Uh, what country does Real cooperate in? Uh, Pakistan land, uh, Swanland, Emirates land or B land? Oh, 
one second to go. Well done for everybody who went for B-Land. Um, the three who went for Swanland, I'm assuming that was a slip of the finger. So they do operate in B-Land. And Abdul, you are absolutely on fire. Although Sonika is only a couple of points behind you, so hot on your tails there. Uh, five questions. We're halfway through. What is Railco's slogan? In red, our new trains move, but our technology doesn't. In blue, stand in a queue or buy a ticket. We don't mind. In orange, Railco is going off the rails. And in green, getting you there on time in comfort. Outstanding. That's really encouraging to see that many of you have gone further into the exhibits. This was a slogan in the exhibits, which has been pulled out, getting you there on time in comfort. Sonika's winning. Oh, well done, Abdul. Where have you gone? Um, so Sonika, that's, that's pretty impressive. Uh, here we go. Number six. How many non-executive directors, NEDs, sit on the board of Railco? If you don't know, maybe you haven't paid attention to it in the exhibits, have a guess. Oh, yeah. So a little bit of a one there to see if anybody analysed any of the exhibits. There are seven non-executive directors who sit on the board of Railco. So well done. That's uh, illustrated in exhibit one. Sonika, there we go. Salma, you're doing really well. In fact, the top five. Abdul, you've popped back in there. Uh, Mariam, good to see you holding on there in fifth and Anka in third. So we're up to seven. Which factors appear to be having the biggest detrimental or biggest detriment to Railco's financial performance? Are they having increased revenues or are they having poor cost control? Well done, the 48 of you went for poor cost control. Let's be really frank about this. If you're having increased revenues, it's not going to be detrimental to your performance. It's going to improve your financial performance, whereas poor cost control is an issue at Railco and would be one that would cause problems with their organisation. Uh, nice top five. So at this point, we've got, I think, two questions left, up to eight places. Well done, highest climber, TJ. Uh, outstanding. So Mariam in fifth. Sonika in fourth, Salma in third, Abdul, you, you're being consistent, you know, in second, uh, only two points away from the top spot with Ankit holding on to that one. So here we go. Which KPI, key performance indicator, indicates poor staff motivation? So in red, we've got percentage of trains on time. In blue, we've got revenue growth. In orange or yellow, we've got staff turnover. And then in green, we've got operating costs per kilometre. Right. Oh, well done, 41 of you understood that if you have high staff turnover, that is a negative indicator, a poor indicator of staff motivation. Businesses which struggle with lots of people starting and then leaving, so that's what I mean by staff turnover, often aren't very good places to work, and therefore it is an indicator of poor motivation. Uh, right, here we go. Last couple of questions, true or false? Uh, Henrik Kild is the chairman of Railco. I can hear you furiously flicking through the exhibits, trying to find out who the chairman is. Well done if you are. Oh, 
50-50. Yeah, Henrik Kild is the chairman, uh, the chair of Railco. That is true. And we've got one more question to go, which actually is quite interesting. So Fatma, shout out to being fifth. Mariam in fourth, Anki, you've slipped down into third, but you're still very close and in contention at the top spot. Salma in second, and Abdul, you've consistently been within the top five. Um, so here we go. Let's see how we get on with the last question. Uh, this is the decider. True or false, John Rose is the current chief executive of Railco. 50-50. And well done. Yes, 35 of you got it correct. John Rose is the current chief executive of Railco. But for those who have read the full uh, scenario, you might be thinking, well, he won't be there for much longer. So, and the winner with 9 out of 10, Ankit. Well done scoring an impressive 10,694 points. Salma in the silver position and Mariam uh, in a respectable third. At uh, the top five, Abdul in fourth and DD in fifth. Absolutely fantastic, guys. Well done uh, for taking part. I saw more than 60-odd people on the Kahoot out of the 100 or so we've got on the actual session live this evening. So that's really impressive to see that you went to the trouble to engage with it. And hopefully you found it fun. Uh, hopefully you found it engaging and hopefully you'll find use of the actual tool that I use to just get the energy up late on an actual Tuesday evening because I appreciate many of you will be tired. Um, so uh, if you did like that, brilliant. I intend to do some more of those over the course. Um, for those who didn't manage to get on, I saw a few people in the in the question panel saying they struggled. What's the pin? Uh, we'll do some more. So don't worry about that. And for those who didn't manage to get on but still answered questions whilst they were in the actual question panel. Fantastic. So thanks, Grace. Uh, Ibrahim, I'm just guessing them all. Um, and Aisha's put in a few different things on there. So we've got a we've got really good engagement this evening. So hopefully we can continue with that. And well done again, Ankit, for winning the first Kahoot. Um, so stepping back into the presentation and sort of more, more specifically around the requirements, I'm now going to spend some time dissecting the requirements for each actual, well, each part of the exam. In doing so, I'm going to talk through where I find the information and what exhibits I find useful. One thing that I was asked last night um, was that are the exhibits generally chronological to the questions. So what I mean by that is does exhibit one correspond with question or requirement one? Um, that isn't always the case. Um, so I can't explicitly say that it will happen like that. But for the purposes of real curve, we can work along that sort of timeline and work along that exhibit one to one. And if there's any overlap, well, I'll explain how that works as well. Requirement one, hopefully you've read this. I did talk through how I dissected this last night, but for the benefit of those who weren't on and also for the benefit of everyone on, um, we'll talk through it again. So in the bottom right hand corner, 18 marks times it by 1.8. That's 32 minutes you would be expected to spend writing for this requirement. Effective reading and planning means that you read the requirement before you read the case and exhibits and then search the exhibits and the scenario for the most relevant information. So whilst I'm going to be reading the exhibits, I'll know that requirement one has placed me as a non-executive member and the chairman of the nomination and corporate governance committee. So therefore, I know full well from my education and my experience that non-executive directors need to be impartial to the organization in terms of its performance at the voice of the shareholders and have four key roles within a business so those those four key roles i often summarize down and if anybody wants to write this down it could be quite useful um, they have a strategy role so that's the first one s there's also a second s so strategy scrutiny they also are there from a risk perspective, so SSR. And the last one is P, people. So non-executive directors provide strategic insight, strategic direction. They advise the board of directors and the executives through their experience. They also provide scrutiny, the second S. 
So to scrutinize is not necessarily a negative thing. It's to hold people accountable and to question their actions through maybe a skeptical lens, so professional skepticism. So scrutinizing isn't a negative thing. It's trying to just get answers and bear in mind who non-executive directors are. They are the voice and the, the opinions and the eyes and the ears of the shareholders. So they're doing it in a positive way. So firstly, strategy, scrutiny. The next one's risk. Non-executive directors often give significant amounts of risk management advice, and this individual here sits on a corporate governance committee. So they're going to be able to look at the risks of the organisation in terms of its board structure and the roles and responsibilities of them within that board. The last one was P. So currently I've followed a little bit of a mnemonic, SSRP. So I would scribble that down at the side of the requirement, strategy, scrutiny, risk and people. And the P part, well, that stands for the role in which they have to offer diversity within boards of directors. So if you are a non-executive director and you work for an organisation, you are most likely to have been brought in for an array of reasons. But one of them is to help with the board composition. So it might be that you have um, a different background, whether it's in a real industry, it might be that you come from an accounting or finance background, and that's your subject area of expertise. You might come from a legal background. You might come from a different country or a dis different um, demographic, and therefore the people role is instilled within the board and the board composition. So there we are. I see non-executive directors on all of these things fly through my brain, and I want to summarize them quickly by writing SSRP. <clears throat> the recently appointed chairman of the Railco Trust Board has requested that you provide him with information relating to the governance of Railco and the roles and responsibilities of NEDs. Now, to be completely transparent, I had already thought about strategy, scrutiny, risk and people before I even knew what they wanted me to do. And it looks like that level of um, thought process will help with this answer. Required, you've been asked to prepare a briefing paper in yellow, so therefore when I am writing my answer and doing my answer plan, I will write at the top briefing paper and I will understand that it needs to be structured in a brief, succinct, short to the punchy paragraphs with subheadings. I also identify and explain agency relationships in part A. So this is where I want to be searching through the exhibits. So whilst doing so, I'll probably want to be looking at particularly Exhibit 1. Exhibit 1 is, um, is an overview of the actual leadership and governance of the organisation. So as I read through Exhibit 1, I'll be looking for agency relationships. And remember I talked to you yesterday about when you see the word and within your discussion. So when you see or when you see word and within the requirements, you want to draw a line through it. And that represents to me another section within the actual requirement. So firstly, identify and explain agency relationships and then discuss their rights and responsibilities. You are looking to demonstrate communication skill and that's a significant professional skill. Therefore, you want to take considerable notice that it is a briefing paper and that you have been asked to do so by the chairman, the senior individual in the organisation. Section B, assess the role and the value of a non-executive director on the board of Railco as a public sector company. Non-executive directors have four key roles, strategy, scrutiny, risk and people. So you could structure your answer using strategy as one heading, scrutiny as another, risk as another and people as another. But it needs to be not rote learning. It's all well and good knowing what NEDs do and what they are. But you need to apply it to real cut. You need to apply the term and use it to make sure that you assess the value to real cut and be specific in terms of it being a public sector organization. Um, moving forward, then, the actual assessment of the professional skill here is the evaluation skill. So you will want to probably give some form of summary or conclusion at the end of your answer. I've come back to the introduction because it actually gives you an overview of the composition of the board. So we've got the trust board at the top, we've got the board of directors, we've got the executive committee which I've highlighted in red, and then in blue I've circled up the other committees. 
Um, so I might want to discuss the agency relationships within that piece of information. And it looks like there's a few. So there's an agency relationship between the Railco Trust Board uh, and the Transport Minister. There's an agency relationship between the Board of Directors and the committees. So again, that's something that I'm churning through. I'm thinking, right, I can talk about this. And I'm going now specifically to exhibit one, uh, the page on, of the website, which gives me uh, insight into leadership and governance of Railco. So when you did do the Gahoo, I'm assuming that those who got the slogan, which is get you there on time and in comfort, had already read this or had a quick search whilst they were doing the Gahoo. To give you a taste of Railco, the mission, um, which is sometimes a strategic purpose of the organisation. Uh, is to provide high quality, efficient and cost effective rail services to all our passengers. Try to set the tone for the organisation. And their vision is to become world leading in providing reliable, profitable and safe train passenger service in a climate which embraces new technology and diversity of ideas. So if it's the first time you've read this, you're probably thinking, wow, that's uh, no, it sounds like a quite a reputable organization. They are concerned about the actual passengers. So they talk about the passengers in their mission. Um, they talk about being reliable, profitable and safe. And they also talk about embracing new technology. As we do go through this scenario and we do dissect the case, what you will probably find is that there is a slight contradiction and that in reality, they may be armed being as profitable and as good to passengers as they might want to let you believe. And they are maybe embracing technology as much as they should. Exhibit one, our board, the Railco board, is responsible for the strategic direction of Railco. So the Railco board overall, they're the ones who are going to be supervising and running and giving leadership and strategic direction to the business. Our chief executive reports directly to the Minister of Transport. There's an agency relationship. Fantastic. So we've identified an agency relationship within the exhibit one and then in red i've circled up the board and who it comprises of so we've got seven non-executive directors so we've got one uh, henrik who's the actual chair so that's the chairman uh, we've got the chief executive which is currently ross uh, sorry currently john rose we've got a finance director and then a director of infrastructure and projects and then we've got six other non-executive directors which have all been appointed to the board at various points in time um, overall, uh, I'd be interested, actually. In fact, this is a question for you guys. So please throw it into the question panel, your answer. Uh, from your understanding of board compositions, is that a good level of non-executive directors of proportion to executive directors? Is it good or bad? Good, I've seen quite a lot of engagement already. I'll, uh, I'll just sort of wade in in a second. Right then, guys. Uh, moving in, so the overall answer is quite frankly, it's a good, it's a good split. Um, the, the, the best practice, and many of you have rightly said this, that it should at least be 50-50, but they've got more non-executive directors than executives. Uh, and one individual, I'm just going to see if I can find them, Nasir, quite rightly said um, that given it's a public sector organisation, having more non-executive directors is certainly a good thing it's not a bad thing at all so for those who wrote bad it's not a hard and fast rule it's not a strict rule that it should be 50 50 it should at least be 50 50 and given the nature of real being a public sector organization having more non-executive directors on the board is a good thing for those who are thinking well actually alex come on there needs to be some more executives well there are and they're actually in the executive committee. So this is where it starts to balance out a little bit more. This isn't a board, this is a committee. Now the committee provide um, a delegation tool from the board, so these are operations, um, and these individuals here, there are five executives. 
So we've got uh, Lara, Jasper, George, Thomas, and Brenda, and they all provide some form of operational management of the actual organization. And therefore, they'll have the expertise and they are executives. So this is a good composition. The board's looking very strong at the minute. As we go into the detail of the uh, board committees, uh, our four, four board committees made up of non-executive directors, so even better still, assist the board with the responsibility. So we've got a safety, health and environmental committee. This committee monitors the integrity and the method of the methods used to carry out safety and health responsibilities. Uh, we've got an audit and risk committee. They look at the integrity of the financial statements and the audit process, as well as reviewing internal controls. A remuneration committee is an absolute fantastic committee to be a part of. Um, they effectively decide how much people get paid. Um, and in this instance, they determine the remuneration of the directors. And then we've got a nomination and corporate governance committee, which looks at, look at the size, structure and composition of the board. And they're obviously doing quite an effective job. And you, within this scenario, if we just flip back, go back to the requirement. You are a non-executive member and chairman of the Nomination and Corporate Governance Committee. So when you are taking into consideration who you are when providing the answer to requirement one, you will sincerely need to take a significant amount of understanding that this committee reviews the size, structure and composition of the board and the committee identifies and nominates candidates for appointment to the board to ensure that there is an appropriate succession planning in place and i really like that term in fact if i can get my clicker to work i will just throw a little highlight on it it's a nice techie term uh, it's something that's quite quite well used it's good terminology succession planning uh, a nomination committee and a nomination and corporate governance committee are concerned with succession planning Companies like Railco, large organisations, require succession planning to ensure that the, um, the longevity of the people on the actual the board of directors are up to and fit for purpose within this sector. Ooh, just clear that little yellow dot. I don't know why it stayed on there. Do apologise. Uh, erase all drawings. Here we are. The last part of the Exhibit 1. Um, the Railco Trust Board is an independent statutory body with powers vested by the government of Beeland and its members. Moving through the highlighted areas, the Trust Board consists of 10 members, all of whom are appointed by the Ministry of Transport. Our board is accountable to the Railco Trust Board. So there is another agency relationship. So as I'm reading through this, I'm looking for the agency relationships that need to be used in my answer plan within question 1A. Uh, moving forward again, the Trust Board is the supreme governing body which holds us to account for delivering what we promise. The Board is also accountable to the Railco Trust Board for our health and safety performance. And lastly, our Chief Executive is personally accountable for the governance or, or to the government even for Railco stewardship of the public funding. So at this point, this is where I'm going to show you how I plan an answer. I again appreciate the technology side of things. I've planned mine on a PowerPoint, and therefore I've been able to type it up. Uh, your answer plan can generally be a few points, a few key areas. And I would like you now, so I'm going to flick back to the requirement for question 1A, um, spend a couple of minutes, so maybe just, you know, 60 seconds, 120 seconds, doing a quick answer plan. So identify agency relationships. Throw a little few squiggles where you're going to explain them and also put what the rights and responsibilities are. So what time is it now? If I just have a little quick look at the clock. According to my clock, it is 43. So at 45, uh, I will be looking into the actual uh, question box and seeing if you guys can identify any agency relationships in there. And feel free to help each other out as well. So just throw them in the question box and then I'll have a quick review of that as well.
Thank you, Bilal. I see you've popped something in the question box so far. Uh, there's Trust Board and Ministry, Chief Executive and the Government. Uh, we've got the Board and the Trust Board as well. Uh, we've got a uh, Aisha, thank you very much. I appreciate your insights. So, uh, what have we got there? Agency relationship is related uh, of the principal and director uh, due to the separation of ownership and control of the operations. So, you've talked there about the government board and taxation. And say very good insight there. The most important agency relationship is between the public, so the taxpayer, and the real co board. So, well done. Paul, well done, yeah. Real and the government. Hussain, yes, um, the Real Code Trust Board is an agent of the public at large because of the taxpayer. Uh, John, fantastic. The Ministry of Transport and the taxpayer, there's another agency relationship. So what we're doing, guys, is if you are um, popping things into the actual question panel, you need to be telling me what the agency relationships are that you've been able to pull out of exhibit one, and many of you have done a fantastic job of that. Bilal, fantastic, the responsibility, so moving further into your answer plan, uh, to protect the interests of shareholders and increase their confidence, it quite rightly is. So if I sort of move, oh, hang on a minute, there we go. If I move now back into the presentation and just walk through to what my answer plan looks like, um, and we can discuss that as well, and I'll talk you through that as we go along. So if we go through here, answer plan for 1A, uh, and I've always thrown up the, the requirement in the top right, just so I'd have to keep clicking back, to be honest with you, um, but it's also a little nod of the hat um, that you need to always consider the requirement and keep it in mind and ask yourself when you are writing up an answer, whether it's in a plan or whether you're doing it in the exam in continuation, am I answering what's being asked of me? Because we saw yesterday from the examiner's reports, lots of students answering questions that they wanted to be actually given as opposed to what was really being asked of them. So it is a briefing paper and I need to write that in my answer plan. It's for the attention of the Rail Code Trust Board and the heading, the key heading for what it's going to talk about is agency relationships, their rights and responsibilities. We talk here about the principles. So I've put the government of Beeland uh, in the form of the Ministry of Transport could be considered to be the principle. And then I could go even further to talk about that the ultimate principle could be perceived as a taxpayer. And I know that a few of you in the question box said that. So if you did think that that was the case, you would be scoring at least two marks there for a well expanded point and a discussion about why it's the taxpayer who's the ultimate principle and maybe how that agency relationship is actually created. <coughs> Excuse me. Another agent is the Real Code Trust Board and the Board of Directors. The Board of Directors and the Real Code Trust Board, as, uh, as I go further into it, um, there is a direction of accountability. The Trust Board is responsible to set performance targets. It states that in the case, so I'm using the case. And then I go a little bit further, so when I'm asking myself, so what? Um, so what? Well, they're setting performance targets based on value for money so that the organisation spends public funding in a responsible way. The chief executive officer, so the chief exec of Railco, is ultimately responsible to the government of Beeland for the management and stewardship of public funding. And that is another agency relationship. And you have also discussed the responsibilities there. If we flick through now... Just onto the marking guide, we can see that for part 1A, you get up to two marks for each identified agency relationship of at least four parties involved in Railco and up to a maximum of eight in total. Now, given that there is only eight marks available and they've said at least four, you would be expected around two marks per each relation, agency relationship, correctly identified, explained and related back to roles and responsibilities. So with that being said, I wouldn't stress doing any more than four because you would just be wasting your time and keep moving through your exam and probably moving on to part B. 
How do students score well in the communication? Well, we've got the lovely marking key at the bottom here, and this talks you through, you know, what's not so good all the way through what is good. So we range from getting nothing all the way up to getting two marks. So if a candidate has demonstrated poor communication skills, and this really comes down to the presentation and being slightly sort of unambiguous, uh, it's not communicated in the appropriate format, so it's not a briefing paper, you would get zero. So some students will write in an essay format. They, they seem to not be able to get out of that habit. It's a briefing paper. It needs to be structured as a briefing paper, and therefore it needs to be two. Uh, it needs to give headings. It needs to have sort of a structure with that and go flowing through. If we work our way across, and we'll sort of move over to the set two marks, that's where we want to be aiming. Uh, the candidates have demonstrated excellent communication skills. There is a briefing paper which was correctly structured. They've covered all the relevant points by the trust board and they understand the agency relationship and have done it in the correct turn. So quite rightly, you would get more marks for a better quality answer um, and a more marks for a better standard of answer included in the professional marks. So there was 10 marks in totality available there, and that should have really, in ideal world, taken 10 minutes, sorry, taken 18 minutes to do. Moving into requirement B, and actually I've naively just shown you my answer plan. Um, if I just take a little scop skip back, and we'll do a similar sort of thing there. So I want you guys to, to throw into the question panel a few areas. And I did kind of give you a little bit of a structure. Um, so assess the role and value of a non-executive director on the board of on the board of Railco as a public sector organization, showing that you can demonstrate an evaluation skill. So there are six technical marks plus two professional marks for evaluation. I'm going to give you guys another 120 seconds to throw some ideas into the question panel to really just engage with the actual rest of everyone and we can discuss them as we go along. While you're doing that, I'm just actually flicking through a few other bits in the question panel that I uh, I didn't see. So um, someone's asking, what does FAO stand for? For attention of, um, that's what that stands for. So it was for the attention of, and let me just double check this. For the attention of the Real Code Trust Board. Yolanda, I'm just having a read of one of your points as well uh, in regards to agency relationships exist between the board of directors and to the trust board. Therefore, the board as a fiduciary duty to the trust board. I really like that. Um, <clears throat> I do apologise for this little tickly cough. Yolanda, you've really hit the nail on the head for everybody's benefit. The term fiduciary is a, is a term used to explain or strengthen an answer when you're talking about a direction and a duty of care. Um, it's something you actually cover in your law paper, um, and a fiduciary responsibility is that of the agent to the principal to act with a duty of care and trust. Great stuff. So for part B, uh, where you are assessing the role of and the value of non-executive directors on the board of Railco as a public organisation, many of you have popped in some great stuff. So we've got Bill Al, scrutinise expertise, risk and people role. Thank you very much. Um, Furkan, they are supposed to provide independent suggestions and advice. That they are. Aisha, so we've got that word fiduciary in there again uh, to scrutinise, so challenge the decisions of the executive directors. Uh, they have a people duty, so they'll sit on the nomination and remuneration duties as well. Uh, they are to monitor 
um, the executive directors, which will increase their value. Fantastic. Uh, Furkan, to promote discussion at a strategic level. Uh, Wellington, just to be completely straightforward, yes, you can write FAO in your exam. You can use well-known abbreviations or standard abbreviations. FAO, for attention of, is something that you're perfectly happy to do, so. Um, Abdul Qadir talking there about stakeholders, which is important, so thank you. Uh, in the context of strategy, the board of directors of Railco should engage a long-term strategy which, would be cons which could consider a wider stakeholders, including passengers who benefit the service, investors in the Railco who are able to invest in the company, and they're going to steward that investment. Wonderful. Lots going on in there. Um, so, Hussein, uh, the last, you're the last individual who's, who's put a comment. So, independence and objectivity, unbiasedness and behaviour is essential as in the role of a non-executive director. This is some brilliant work, so thank you very much for all of those. And there was many other things. And if I don't get a chance to read them all out, it's because, well, there was that many of them. So, keep them coming, though. And uh, when I do have a break, I'll have a chance to collate a few things and give you all a shout out where I need to be. So moving back through the presentation and going through to my answer plan. Assess the role and value of an NED. Uh, it's a briefing paper for the attention of the Railco Trust Board. And this section is the role and value of NEDs at Railco. You might want to start by talking that non-executive directors are not employees. They have a contract of service and a paid a service fee. And they do that because they need to be independent, as many of you have correctly said, from the organisation. If you were to give a non-executive director performance related pay, they would be more likely to be more concerned about the overall profitability as opposed to stewarding the investment of a shareholder or other stakeholders. Um, Higgs report of 2003, that's a nice technical report within your syllabus. Um, gives you the structure, so strategy, scrutiny, risk and people, and I've talked through those four key roles, so giving strategic direction at a leadership level, scrutinising the executive directors and the decisions they make, providing risk management and giving expertise on risk management to ensure that the business's risk management is, is appropriate, therefore you're matching your risk appetite to your risk capacity. And they also have a people role in terms of diversity and ensuring the composition. It is best practice for at least 50-50 non-executive directors to execs. And we saw in exhibit one that Real Code's board of directors already has seven to three. And you might see that I put a little green smiley face next to that, illustrating that I would want to go on and talk in my answer about how positive that is. Real Code's committees have a particular importance, given that it is a public sector organization, because the committees are made up completely of non-executive directors. So you link that back to your actual question. Given that there is public funding, there is a significant need for scrutiny and transparency. So these are using key terminology. And again, I'm popping that in my answer plan so that when I come to writing out my actual full answer in my answer booklet, I'm making sure that I use these terms and I'm not getting a little bit over confused or a little bit bogged down in the time management. Railco's chairman, Henrik, is a non-executive director uh, who runs the board of directors. They are responsible for the management and stewardship of the public funding. So that's one of their key roles. And then I would maybe give my evaluation at the end, which is this last point. And this is where I would pick up my at least two marks for my evaluation skills. Non-executive directors add value. They add value through expertise. They add value through cross-fertilization of ideas, and they ultimately appraise the organization's value for money, um, and they give an independence and objective view. Some students, when I've done this before, talked about the uh, three E's of value for money in their answer, and that's also relevant. So just because my answer plan might not have everything in it, because if it did, it would probably take up an entire PowerPoint. Um, doesn't mean that there isn't additional things to add. So yes, you could talk about the three E's. If you're not familiar with the three E's, the three E's are effectiveness, efficiency, and economics. And they are a value for money framework for appraising a business like Railco. 
when looking at the mark allocation, one mark per relevant point for assessing the role and value of a non-executive director of Railco's board. And then there is a focus on the marks that should be specific to the role within a public sector organisation. Moving into the uh, professional marks, and we'll do what we did last time, you get zero marks if you fail to demonstrate any evaluation. So the answer is merely descriptive and gives no evidence. So you must use your judgment, being professional judgment, to evaluate the NEDs and the value to real co. Supremely good answers, so which get two marks for their uh, for their evaluation. They give that the directors, the non-executive directors within this, and they also focus upon it being a public sector organisation. So they're very case specific. Need to clear that again. What I'd like to do now, because we're an hour into our session, is just see if there's any questions which pertain particularly to requirement one. Um, so I'll open up my chat panel, if I can do that. Yep, there we go. Or, sorry, my question panel, and expand it and see if there's anything in there that's particularly relevant and can be helpful for those students which have been really engaging with requirement one. Uh, Furkan, wonderful. Thank you. Straight away, straight in there. Uh, can you elaborate by what you mean by cross-fertilisation of ideas? So the term cross-fertilisation of ideas in relation to Railco would probably link back to the fact that organisations like Railco will need lots of expertise from different parts of the organisation, different parts of businesses and different industries. So as an ACCA student and as an ACCA member, me and you uh, and the other individuals on this call will probably have somewhat similarities in terms of our way of thinking. But if you were to bring in somebody from another area of a profession, so maybe an engineer, they may take into consideration the elements and expertise that we do not. So we might be quite naturally good at understanding financial statements, for an example. Uh, so we'll be concerned with things like profitability and costs. Whereas an engineer might be concerned with more operational things like the maintenance of the trains and the breakdowns. And then they might also get a non-executive director from a health and safety point of view, which they certainly will do, given they have a committee based on health and safety. And they may also bring in a risk manager to sit on as a non-executive director. These cross-fertilisation of ideas um, allows for a better stewardship of the taxpayers' investments. Furkan, has that hopefully given you a little bit more insight? Having a read through some more of the questions. Uh, oh, sorry, Wellington Jack, I've only just seen this. Uh, sorry to bring this back up again. Is a briefing paper similar to a briefing note? Yes, it is. Uh, Furkan, wonderful. I'm just having a read through a couple of other questions, so keep them coming. Aisha, I'm just reading your questions. So we, as we discussed yesterday, um, that we jump, sorry, that we go through the requirements first and then jump into scenario. And then your next point, I'm just going to paraphrase. So you're saying, but data remains in different exhibits. How can we ensure that we have to write and gather sufficient data? And that's why uh, in the reality of the real exam, when you are doing your answer plan, it is best to go through all of the exhibits as you go along. Um, Strictly speaking, you can pull anything from any of the exhibits, um, and it's just a case of that most exhibits will correlate, so the exhibit one will match with requirement one, so there will be some form of chronological order, but there may also be areas within their exhibits. It's just a case of doing your planning and pulling elements from the exhibits. So what I would say is an answer plan can be done per requirement as you go along. So you might choose to do your answer plan on individual pages within your answer booklet, and then you can go back and add bits to each answer plan as you go along. Uh, 
Uh, Bilal, I like that question. Do you think it is possible to get at least one professional mark for structure in every question? Yes, certainly is. Um, you've put example reports or slides. I think, in all honesty, these professional marks are a gift. There are 20 of them. So why not, if you follow the correct structure, get at least one? You might even get one and a half. And if you do a really good answer, you probably get two or even more because they don't just do one and two. They go up to threes and fours as well. Yolanda, uh, when you get an opportunity, can you touch on big data and disruptive technology? I can and I will be, actually. Uh, I'll be doing that not this evening. I'll be doing that in evenings four and five, uh, particularly big data. Nasir, how to rightly turn your answer? Um, to be quite honest with you, it just depends on who you are writing your answer to and who you are in this particular scenario. And in all honesty, if you write in a in a very professional manner, you can't go wrong. So you want to be writing it as if you are giving it to a client or if you are giving it to your boss. And therefore, the turn of your requirement, the turn of your answer needs to be written in a professional manner. So therefore, using appropriate English, not using any slang. That's what I mean by turn and therefore addressing the individual correctly as well with um, the appropriate greetings and appropriate um, goodbyes to your sincerely kind regards, things like that. Uh, yes, so there's a question there, and I do apologize, I'm gonna to struggle to pronounce your name. Uh, and I'll try, and I'll try, and if I get it wrong, you can shout at me um, virtually. The question is, uh, instead of annotating on the question paper, can we write our plan and the answer booklet? Yes, you can, and I actually believe that is a good way of actually doing an answer plan. Um, Galakiu, I do apologise if I've got that wrong, um, but your question was fantastic. Farhan, uh, I'm not sure if that's a question or a statement. How to start answer from scenario or from requirement? You want to start with the requirement in terms of actively reading the requirement, dissecting it and breaking it down. And then you want to go through the, the case material, so the actual exhibits and the introduction, and then plan your answer out, pulling out the key points from the case study. Atiba, uh, so how are we going to evaluate the roles and responsibilities by identifying them and expanding them and giving a conclusion at the end? Yes, that is a perfect example. So given the nature of this question, given that it throws emphasis for Part B being a public sector organisation, my last point in my plan uh, if I just flick back to it in my hand, is that the NEDs add value through ultimately independence and objectivity, and they must do so um, by adding expertise, cross-fertilization of ideas, and appraising the value for money. This is significantly important given the nature of the public sector organization, which receives taxpayers' money. Uh, Kennedy, is it acceptable to start with the last requirement and not the first? Uh, do you mean it start with requirement five instead of requirement one? Then yes, that is perfectly fine. It is not massively advisable to start with part B instead of part A. You would potentially not score very well in the professional marks. Having said that, it's not the end of the world if you do decide to do that. But again, you can pick the questions in any order. So question one to five, start with five then do three if you want to do that, but it would be ill-advised to split the requirement parts of A and B and do them in a different order. Aisha, that's fine. Yeah, your sincerely remains at the end of a letter, so there's some good professional turn and language, but in a briefing paper, um, you could end with kind regards um, uh, and then just put, yeah, conclude in the last paragraph. Yeah, I will go back to so can I start that again? So Kanina, um, so Kanina Batul, thank you very much. Can you guide on how to apply the communication skills in one A? Um, so if we, if I go back to my actual answer plan for one A, and we go to the communication section, it's all realistically around the structure. 
So this part here kind of gives you the answers. In fact, that's absolutely ridiculous, Alex. Why have I scribbled all over it? Um, here we go. Candidates demonstrate excellent communication skills because they put it in a briefing paper structure. So they write brief paper, they write for the attention up, and then they structure it with subheadings and they move through and then they ultimately close at the end of that. Um, they cover all relevant points needed by the trust board in understanding agency relationships and was set in the correct turn. And I believe someone was alluding to that earlier, whereby we were talking about professional language and the correct tense and actual audience to be written to. I'm going to open up my uh, question panel again and people are still flying in there. Um, so I just bear me one second. Kevin, you've wrote how to avoid getting our marks deducted. We do not negatively mark. So ACCA, when we mark your actual scripts, there is no such thing as negative marking. So we do not see anything that. So if you write something completely incorrect, although you won't score any marks for it, we do not reduce your marks as a result of that. So then, guys, um, what I'm going to do is because that's probably a natural pause before we move on to requirement two. It is um, 8.11. So I'll just get out of the PowerPoint and I'll do a little pause. So if I can click exit. Um, 2011 or 2012. So we'll go. Oh, there we go. Uh, we'll take a natural pause. So we will come back. Or I'll look back in around 15 minutes, so that'll be 27. Um, so while we have a break, what I'll be doing is I'll be reviewing the, the question panel. So if more questions fly in, fantastic. Um, also go for a little comfort break and grab yourself a cup of tea or a water. And then when we get back, we're going to have a walk through requirement two. So I'm going to freeze the screen as well. Uh, and when we get back, we will be going through requirement two. And any questions, keep the questions coming into the question panel. It really does genuinely make all the world of difference. So thank you very much.
Hey gang, um, five more minutes break, so if you're not on the call, don't worry about that. Um, and I guess I said, if you've got any other questions, just keep them coming into the question panel and I'll try and address them as we go along. All right, so speak to you soon. Thank you. Cheers, Aisha. I've not gone anywhere. Um, I'm just making sure everyone still knows I'm around. But uh, yeah, just take a little break and uh, we'll pop back on in five minutes. Thank you. Evening folks, we'll kick back off in one more minute, so um, if you've got any questions, please do throw them into the question panel. Uh, 
And we're back in the room. So hopefully you've had a, a, a refreshment. You've got yourself a cup of tea or something to drink and you've stretched your legs. Um, I am now going to sort of have a quick flick through because there is a few questions in the question panel. Um, so Sajid, I'm going to start with yours. Can we pass the SBL exam without gaining any professional marks? The answer is no, you cannot. You must score both um, technical and professional marks and the way in which you do so is you structure your answer correctly, you address the audience, you take note of who you are in the scenario and who you are correctly um, addressing, so who, who the actual audience will be, and you write it in a professional term. Um, these professional marks are generally quali quality marks, they're correlated to a good quality answer, so you will have to score both of them. So moving on now, uh, we're going to start looking at requirement two. And again, you know, as always, if you do have any questions, throw them in the question panel. Uh, and we're going to do it in a very similar way like we would dissected requirement one. So I'm going to read through the requirement two. I am going to dissect it and pull it apart, um, do some active reading and go through the exhibits. With this particular requirement, it uses more exhibits. It uses your understandings from exhibit one, and it ranges all the way through to even further exhibits. So, excuse me. So we'll be doing some calculations looking at the uh, exhibit two, which is the transport um, report published in the newspaper and the passenger survey and the performance analysis of exhibits two and three on top of that. <coughs> I apologize, I got a little tickle. Um, you are an assistant auditor. Fantastic. So we've got a promotion. Um, and we are reporting to an individual known as Alex Reed, who is a senior audit officer of the NAA. So that is our audience. This is who we are. So we are setting the scene. We have a role and an audience. Alex leads the team of assistant auditors and audit analysts and will be responsible for reporting the findings of the NAA's investigation of Rilke to a number of relevant parties, including the Minister of Transport, the Board of Directors of Railco and the Railco Trust Board. As part of the investigation commissioned by the Minister of Transport to undertaken by NAA, one of the audit analysts working on your audit team has prepared a spreadsheet supplying a variety of data following the recent passenger survey results and using other relevant performance related information. So right now I'm smiling, I'm, well, you can't see it unfortunately, but I'm smiling because I'm thinking great stuff, I'm going to get to do some analysis with numbers and I'm an accountant and I love that sort of thing. Required. Alex Reed, your boss, has asked you to prepare a report. So knowing what a report structure is necessary in this particular requirement, uh, for the Railco Trust Board, and that is your audience. The key verb here, evaluates. So I talked about this yesterday. The term to evaluate is one whereby you need to look at both sides of an argument. You can't just be one-sided, and ultimately you will want to probably come to some form of conclusion. So you might be looking for good things and bad things. Don't just tell the bad things, because that is not an evaluation. Don't just say the good things, because that is not an evaluation. You need to try and give some form of both sides. It doesn't always have to be balanced. It may be that there are more good than bad, or vice versa, but you certainly can't look at it through one lens. You would be evaluating or evaluates the implications of the findings of the passenger survey results, so you will be looking at exhibit three, and reviews the actual and relevant performance or relative performance of Railco in the last three years. I do apologize for the stammer there. I was just trying to think how I was going to get this point across, and the reality is, is I've done it already. The and has a line for it. So there are two sections, technically, within this one section of part 2A, which is 12 marks. So you will be going through, uh, looking for around maybe six key things, and you will be talking about the implications of the passenger survey results and how that compares to their actual and relative performance. And we're going to talk about how I'm going to plan this answer out. We'll need your calculator. Uh, which is fantastic. So if you did heed my warning yesterday, you will need a calculator in this exam. Uh, and you are going to demonstrate your analysis skill by being able to correctly and appropriately analyze information and draw evaluations from that. So you don't get a lot of marks for doing the numbers. Where you get a considerable amount of marks is for actually adding causation and actually adding your insight from a variety of expertise 
from the exhibits and the knowledge within your professional brain. Moving into part B, you are now a few days later. So we was a timeline progressing within this scenario. Uh, a few days later, Alex, your boss, calls you into the office to discuss Realco's governance and internal controls. During that meeting, he referred to the transport report in the Beeland Herald newspaper, and they've quite nicely told you to look at exhibit two. And then also handed you a copy of the minutes from the latest board meeting, um, which is exhibit four. So unlike the previous requirement, they didn't necessarily give you direction on the exhibits. Here they have, which they do invariably, and it also really helps you as a student to guide you as to what you should be reading when you are doing your planning. You are required, so Alex has asked you to draft a letter. Fantastic. Does anybody know how to draft a letter? In this modern day and age, it's not the most normal thing to do. We love to write emails, but we don't often write letters. But as a professional, it would be presumed that you know how to write a letter. You will be addressing the chairman, so you will send it to the chairman of the Railco Trust Board. So we've also got our audience there. You actually, within that letter, need to review the effectiveness of the internal controls of Railco using the minutes, so using Exhibit 4, and any other suitable resources or any other suitable sources. So it isn't just saying use Exhibit 4, it's also saying read further. You can pull things from other exhibits as well, so fantastic. And then there's a line to and again. So now you need to move into another part of the answer, which is to justify that the chief executive of Railco, so I believe that was John Rose, um, is failing in his fiduciary duties to the trustees of Railco. Now, many of you, very, very bright individuals, have already put in the question panel the term fiduciary speaking previously. Maybe you've read the requirements and you pulled that word, or maybe you just use it in your normal terminology. Just to reiterate, the chief executive has a fiduciary duty because they are an agent of the business. They are acting on behalf of the organization. Therefore, their fiduciary duty is to act in the best interests of the shareholders or technically the stakeholders, which in this instance, given it's a public company, will be the taxpayers. So it's giving you a direction of argument within this particular requirement, justifying that the chief executive is failing. It wants you to say effectively why is the chief executive failing? And you can look for those failures within the exhibits as we go along and do our plan. Professional skills will be awarded for skepticism, which will be to question the opinions and assertions made by the chief executive uh, at the recent board meeting. And there are a doozy of assertions and opinions, too many opinions, which are quite obviously incorrect given the nature of the requirement and given the nature of the scenario. Um, 43 minutes would be given in writing time. So you would do your plan and reading and then you would have at least 43 minutes as the perfect sort of amount of time to write up part A and part B. Obviously there's more to do in part A, so you would spend the appropriate 1.8 minutes per mark for those 14 marks, and then you would spend the remaining 18 minutes on the 10 marks available there. Effective reading and planning. Let's go through our exhibits. We are going to specifically now look at exhibit two and exhibit three. This is the transport report. Now, you guys will hopefully have this to hand, and as we go through it, feel free. You may have already read it, which is superb, but I am going to walk through it. Uh, I'm going to zoom in on sections, and I'm going to pull out a few little key areas which I've highlighted as we go along. Um, so the turn from the Beeland Herald, which is a, a widely distributed daily newspaper uh, in Beeland, has started their report, uh, started their news article, with a very um, tactless or tactful, I don't know, it depends how you want to look at it, um, punchy headline. Is Railco going off the rails? This sets the, the turn for the actual newspaper's article. It gives you a flavour as to maybe things aren't as, um, as good as they would like them to be at Railco. I'm just going to highlight out the yellow areas. So um, it appears they're losing support of loyal customers. Um, there is an increasing population in Beeland and a significant level of government investment in its development. And I'm actively reading this. I'm thinking, well, is anything I'm highlighting here? Can I pull that back in or does that relate back to the requirement? So I'm keeping in mind the requirement as I'm going along. 
Um, they've invested in new trains, but the commuters are arguing that it's still overcrowded. Um, they have not invested in an online ticket purchasing system, which is making us unhappy. I say us, I'm not a customer of the Beeland Railco company. Having said that, I have travelled on many trains and overcrowded trains, I'm sure you can all try and relate, are not the most pleasant things to be on. Um, the public perception is at an all time low. That's not very good. Uh, and the Minister of Transport has been asked why revenue is growing, uh, sorry, start that, revenue growth is stagnant. And why customers are increasingly unhappy. So again, this, this is quite a damning report so far um, from the Beeland Herald. Uh, the government has also set real code number of performance targets to meet each year. I'd be interested to know what those performance targets are and it could potentially be further into the exhibits as we go along. Flipping over to the other side, despite evidence of growth in the passenger numbers, uh, passenger footfall, of about 10%, revenue has hardly increased. Wow. So if that's not a piece of qualitative and quantitative information that I would like to comment on in my answer, um, if I was looking at a business and I said, wow, we've actually got more passengers, 10% more, I would actually be expecting around 10% an increase in revenue. Well, that's not happened. So there's got to be a problem. In fact, I alluded to this in our Kahoot. The problem is, quite, quite frankly, cost control. And they've got a lot of issues in terms of internal controls with fraudulent activity on these trains. And we learn more about that as we progress through the exhibits. In the last two annual reports, Railco's directors have highlighted the risk of significant numbers of passengers traveling without tickets. So these passengers are fraudulently getting onto the train. Maybe they don't have a barrier. That's the first thing that springs to my mind. Or maybe the train guards aren't doing their job correctly, which is a sad thing to say. Or maybe because of the crowding, they aren't able to get everybody who are managing to sneak on the trains. That's going to have a ramification for those people who are paying for train tickets. Um, I'm sure many of you can relate uh, and could relate in many different contexts. If you get on a train and you witness somebody not paying, you have paid for your ticket. That is significantly demotivating as your customer satisfaction. So that could be another correlating variable as well. Um, they suggest that this could be due to the fact that Railco does not operate a ticket barrier in many stations and only catch the minority of those who actually commit fraud. As a consequence, is static sales. Railco is repeatedly increasing its ticket prices. Why is it doing that? Well, it's trying to keep hold of its revenue and trying to actually protect its performance um, by inflating the lit in the last three years and customers have complained bitterly. I know that I don't like it when prices increase and therefore if I was a regular commuter, this could actually represent a significant proportion of my disposable income. Many have threatened to use their cars, so we've got options there for people using other modes of transport and other forms of public transport. Maybe they're getting buses as well. Again, some qualitative information on staff turnover is an all time high um, and also customers are unhappy. So it goes further to talk about stakeholders. Um, the real cost stakeholders seem to become increasingly frustrated with a lack of meaningful response from the chief executive. So if we consider what we're looking for in section B of part two, um, we need to understand why is the chief exec being quite unresponsive? And as a stakeholder, I wouldn't be happy with a chief executive officer who isn't communicating effectively. Is that a breach of his fiduciary duties? Um, Real code, the results were dis disappointing when it came to the customer survey results. And the last point here, um, the government of Real code has the full backing of the government of Beelan to undertake a thorough and effective review. And they make necessary changes to the management of the organization of Real code. So they're threatening already that they're going to make changes, maybe. And if you've had a quick look at the other requirements, which I'm hoping you have, maybe we're going to look to get rid of this chief exec because he is not doing a good job. Now, into exhibit three. Now, this is, again, a sizable exhibit with some numbers in it. And I would like you guys um, to have a read through this as well. And I'm going to do a bit of a sort of walk through and show you what areas I would like you to focus on.
So as I read through, I make a, a key note of the headings of this exhibit. So this is an extract from a passenger survey result. And I want to actually consider a few things. I'm going to see if I can highlight this up. In fact, now I've got a spotlight. So if you can see that little red dot moving around, this is me just emphasizing where I'm looking. So first I looked here and now I am looking. Oh, and now we're going too far backwards. I'll uh, <laughs> do apologize. We'll start that again. There we go. Alex and his usual systems. Right. Overall satisfaction of the journey. Satisfaction with ticket buying facilities, staff and their availability, helpfulness and attitude of the staff, punctuality, reliability of service and then value for money. And then also some examples of customer feedback. And I'm going to draw your attention to this to start with. Uh, many of you will feel fill in feedback. In fact, I know many of you did last night and thank you for the positive feedback. It was something that was shared with me and it is very motivational to hear that you're finding these sessions useful. Um, feedback in this instance is qualitative. It's the comments. So the price of a regular ticket I buy to my commute to work has increased by nearly 10% since last year. Wow. It's not good enough if you're thinking the service hasn't improved. I really cannot understand why, as I do not see this getting more value for money or getting me more for my money. Uh, why is it that when I travel to Ireland, I can book a train ticket online? Yet when I'm in Beeland, I have to buy a ticket at the station. This is very frustrating, and occasionally I use my car to get to work. It's more convenient than queuing for up to half of an hour to buy a train ticket. I'm pretty sure most of you will be able to buy even, you know, aeroplane tickets, rail tickets on your mobile phone. And even this day and age, I'm able to book a taxi on my mobile phone. So with a real company that's not embracing technology, which is in a direct contradiction to their vision of the organization, um, it seems like they're not really putting one for a better expression than money where their mouth is. This last one, I've been a loyal customer to RailCub over 30 years but I am becoming increasingly frustrated with the number of passengers who I see are clearly boarding the train without a ticket. Wow. I pay um, Beeland $45 for each ticket I buy, yet people are traveling for free. Where are the ticket inspectors? Well, they're probably not working anymore because the staff turnover is significantly high. So this is then when I draw your attention to the numbers and I've squared off the ones I'm going to refer to. So I'm looking here at the movement between 2015 and 2016 and I am comparing these figures. And when I am analyzing these numbers, I'm doing this within my plan. I might even scribble it on the exhibit and you could do this sort of maths really quickly. So I'm thinking, right, overall customer satisfaction is down 3%. Um, satisfaction of buying ticket facilities is down 4%. And availability of staff is down 3%. Oh, at least the helpful attitude of staff is up by 2%. And the punctuality and reliability is up by 3%. And then ultimately the value for money is down by 6%. That's, that's a massive, massive problem. I then compare these to the targets set by the trust board. These individuals have set the targets and then my answer would follow a structure of these as the headings. So I would be using these to structure my answer, using these simple movements. It doesn't need to be a huge amount of, of detail. And I would talk about these movements in terms of whether they have met the target and if they haven't met the target, why? Why have they not met the target? So if I just flick through to the next section of this, hopefully it is what I'm looking for. Uh, no, it's not, but um, I'll come back to this. Yes, let's go to this first. And I'll talk about my answer plan for 2A. Uh, evaluate the implications and the findings of the passenger survey results and review the actual and relative performance. It's 12 marks. So I'm probably looking for around half of the six marks or half of the marks or six marks here for talking about each one of these. I would like you guys now to spend around 120 seconds. So just two minutes. So it is 46 minutes past. So I'm going to go silent maybe uh, for the next 120 seconds and throw your assertions, your understanding of what's going on here. So your comments. So the minus three percent of overall satisfaction. Is that a good or a bad thing? And what is that a reflection of? And go down each one if you like, or just pick a couple and get your input into the question panel. Please do that now, and I'll pop myself on mute for a couple of minutes.
So I'm looking for a few things, obviously, in the uh, question panel, and I'm seeing a few all jump in. Aisha, you superstar. Uh, Husnain, thank you very much. Yeah, we've seen this this movement as well. Um, thank you very much. So you you do a, a, a nice sort of structure. You would use the headings. You would do a percentage movement, which is quite a simple thing to do. You just look at the difference. You comment on whether it's met the board target or not. And then you tell me, so what? Why could the customer satisfaction have gone down by X or Y? And you can do that for all of them. And I see lots of people flooding in now. Um, so thank you, Nasir. Yolanda, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hassana, as well. I'll give you another minute or so to keep doing this. It's really effective. I'm just having a read through, don't we? I've not ran off. Yeah, and I see you, you've really hit the nail on the head there. So if I have a little read out of yours, value for money is decreasing significantly due to an increase in ticket prices as a result of static revenue despite an increase in number of users. Yeah, and and so what? I mean, that, that's brilliant, but is that as a result of, you know, overall people not being happy? Is that a good or a bad thing? So you've got to just expand a little bit more, but you're, you're pretty much on the money there. Yolanda, you've put quite a, a lot of things in. Fantastic. Yeah, uh, uh, Hassan, thank you. Yeah, he's also shown a continued trend of customer dissatisfaction. I think I'll jump back in if you don't mind, and you can keep putting into the question panel. I really admire that. Um, if you just take it from an overview point and you look at these numbers, it's it's rubbish. It's absolutely rubbish. Um, they've missed every single performance target set by the trust board apart from one which is the attitude and helpfulness of staff and they've only just hit that with matching the two percent so um, i know what um direction of evaluation i want to be doing it's significantly negative so you're evaluating the negativity but you also want to comment on that one semi-positive Let's see how I'd write that up in an answer plan and let's see how you guys get on as well. So uh, overall customer satisfaction is down 3% versus a uh, target of plus 3% over that year. And I've drawn a, a, an, an unhappy face just to sort of message to myself from a visual point of view, that's not a good thing. This is a reflection of growing customer dissatisfaction. Although 87% is still high, the trend needs to be reversed, and many of you wrote that in your uh, in your question panel there, which is really positive. Uh, satisfaction with ticketing, the actual is minus 4%, and the target it was a plus 2%. Customer feedback reflects frustration. You had some qualitative customer feedback below the report, and it reflects that in the Herald. Um, other providers often offer online purchases. This is genuinely a cause for concern, and if we look at it from a, a bigger perspective, if a train organization such as Railco continues to not embrace technology, it will get left behind. Availability of staff has decreased by 3%. The target was plus 5%. An 8% swing from 2014 to 2016 is very poor. This is as a result of high staff turnover. Helpfulness and attitude of staff. So this is, you know, coming back to a not so bad thing. It's not all doom and gloom, although it predominantly is. Um, the overall performance, the only performance target met by Railco. This is good as it shows good staff commitment. Uh, last two, reliability of service. The actual was plus, C, plus three and the target was plus five. So there is a positive outcome here. It's still gone up so that it's got better. This could be due to an increase in investment in trains. So the Herald talked about the investment, the actual capital expenditure spent to improve the trains. So it's gone up, but maybe not as much as it could have done. So I'm thinking that that's a positive, definitely part of your evaluation, um, but it's overall not a great thing because you haven't hit the target. 
Value for money for the price of tickets. This is a big one. Massively significant. Minus six as opposed to a plus six target. Massively significant, customers have poor perception, it stated that in the Herald, and the railco is in danger of losing its customers. So, so far, you'll have probably got around half the marks um, for talking about the customer satisfaction survey and using the customer satisfaction survey to guide and structure your answer, which I genuinely believe is a really good way of making sure that you do maximise and you logically and methodically move through your answers. If I just take a little flick back and I go back to exhibit three, you can do a very similar thing when looking at the competitor performance analysis. So where I've squared off the red, these are the headings for each line based on revenue, operating costs, kilometres travelled, percentage of trains on time, staff turnover, average price per ticket, average number of employees, overall customer satisfaction, and lost time due to injuries. Wow. And then we've got three different organizations over three different years, ranging from 2014 to 2016. We've got ANR, which is a state-owned, and if you're wondering where I'm getting this information from, it's just at the point one at the bottom of the notes. So ANR is a state-owned rail company which operates passenger services in another country called Ireland. A neighbouring country of Beeland, okay, so it's next to Beeland. Ireland has a population of similar size to Beeland, and ANR is invested in online ticket sales. So it invested it in 2015. So we might want to look at the impact and the value of maybe how that has, has helped the performance, or not helped the performance, it's going to help the performance of ANR. Uh, note number two, Sealand Rail, okay, is a state-owned rail company, so they're both like Beeland, which operates passenger services in Sealand. Sealand is not a neighbouring country of Beeland, but operates on the same continent. Sealand has a larger population than Beeland, but a smaller percentage of Sealand commuters use the rail system to travel. Okay, due to a higher concentration of the population within Sealand being in towns and cities. Interesting. So they've got a bigger population, um, so that might have a, a ramification in terms of maybe the, the span of the costs because it costs more to travel further, but they also have a different percentage of concentration of number of proportionate travellers. Sealand's invested in an online ticket booking system back in 2010. And over 70% of the train tickets are purchased online. Well, I'm telling you all, if that's not a performance indicator which would link back to positive performance, I'm thinking we need to look at how that's going to positively affect rail curve. So we've already talked through A, and I'm happy to go over it again and when we pause for breath, but I'm going to now leave you to have a look at point 2B. And in doing so, I want you to look at key factors. So you need to probably do some calculations, and this will take a little bit of time. And so, and I want, you know, I'm not expecting you to do massive amounts of trigonometry, just some simple percentage movements. Um, so if we're looking at revenue, you might want to look at revenue growth for ANR, Railco and Sealand, so that's probably one you'd want to look at. You'd probably also want to look at the average price per ticket and the percentage change for that as well, so you'll be able to work that out. Um, we, we could probably also work out our operating profit margin by considering the revenues and operating costs. Um, operating cost per kilometre would be a good performance analysis uh, metric. Percentage of trains on time, and also staff turnover. Now, that isn't a definitive list. You can do many other variables of analysis, but I want you to now spend 10 minutes. Maybe that's slightly long. I might lose you on that. I don't want to drift off. Five minutes. There we go. We'll go with five minutes. So it is um, five to nine. So at nine o'clock, I'm going to be here anyway, but at nine o'clock, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to come back in, and I want you to just do some numbers. Uh, based on this competitive performance analysis. And the numbers aren't worth a lot of marks. What I want you to really do is when you're doing the numbers, think about the so what. All right, revenue has increased by X percentage. So what? Uh, Sealand's revenue has increased more or less than real coach. Why do you think that is? Uh, costs have increased or decreased. And, and just do that. And every time you're doing the percentage movement or doing a calculation, the actual real value is all about the, the, the consideration you come in after it. All right.
while you're doing some numbers around the uh, competition uh, analysis, uh, I'm just going to have a read through the questions that remain in the question um, box. So I've seen a couple pop in as well. Uh, Charisse, uh, I'll have a quick look at that in a second. Charisse, I can do that right now. Bear with me one second. I'll, uh, I'll unpause the screen. And I'll, um, I'll do that for you. So if I just go back, uh, answer plan. So this is the first part of the answer plan. And just drop me a line in the question panel when you want me to move to the other one. I'm happy to do so. Sakina Batool, thank you for that question. So you were generally asking, if in an evaluation question, we have very few positive points to discuss in an answer and more negative ones, is that okay? Or is the proportion for each should be the same? Sakina, in life um, and in reality, there may be more negatives than positives. It's just a case of showing that you can identify that there may be another side. So it certainly doesn't have to be balanced. In fact, in this instance, it won't be. There are more negatives. So your answer will have more negative points, but you must consider to get the evaluation professional marks that there could be a few positives as well. So it doesn't have to be balanced. It just needs to have at least two sides to the argument. Thank you for your question. It's really good. Sharice, I can move to the other screen. Yep, so I believe it's this one. Let me know if this is the one you want. And if it's not, I can move to another one as well. Thanks, Sharice. So ladies and gents, I'm going to give you a little bit more time. So I just want you to do some analysis of the second part of Exhibit 3. So you're looking at the competitor performance analysis and you're doing some um, financial movements. You're looking at maybe the revenues, things like staff turnover, maybe doing a bit of a profitability calculation. And then you're looking for the reasons why, because the reasons why the so what is considerably more valuable than just being able to do the, the numbers. Yeah, lots of things flooding in now, some really positive ones. Um, and lots of you are looking at how the revenue increase is good, um, but it might be due to the result of increasing fares, uh, and it's actually not in line with the 10% increase in fares, so that's not a good thing. You're also looking at how operating costs have increased compared to last year, um, and yet some of the competitors' operating costs haven't increased as much. So fantastic analysis. Maybe they're better at cost control. Um, and I also link that maybe back to the level of fraud because costs will have increased in light well, costs will have increased as a result as a as a result of fraud. So that's not good. Nasir, yeah, linking it back to the online ticket system and how they've implemented that and how they've implemented it much earlier. Maybe Sealand absorbed that cost six years ago. So therefore, they're not having to worry about that cost anymore and they're, they're significantly investing. And they're seeing a good return from that.
just a few more minutes. There's some really good things coming into the question panel, so I don't want to stop you while you're on a roll. So please do partake. What we're doing, if you've sort of maybe drifted a little bit, is we're looking at the numbers in the competitor analysis, and we're really just comparing how Realco is getting on compared to A and R and Sealand, and maybe why it's it is how it it is how it is performing. So the causation again is always more important than the number itself. Right then, guys, I'm going to jump back in. So I'm going to now have a look at my answer plan for question 2B. Um, and I've used this structure to try and guide it. So if we just have a quick look back at the, uh, sorry, 2A, I do apologize. Second part of 2A, look at that, I'm getting carried away. Um, we're going to review the actual and relative performance of real curve in the last three years. And we'll be reviewing that against itself and ANR and Sealand. So to do that, you will need to do some numbers. Now, I've been able to present them nicely in a table. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to do that because you might be pressured for time. You might wish to do some numbers in an appendix. And you can just write appendix in your exam paper and do the numbers and spend a couple of minutes doing the numbers quickly. Or you can do the numbers and include them in your answer as you go along. So within section 2A, probably the second part of it, and you might even want to put it onto a new page, I would have a heading saying, you know, revenue growth. And then within that, I would comment on the fact that A&R's revenue has uh, increased by 4.9% and 5.5% in the relative years. Sealand has increased by 8% and 5% again over the same period. However, real curves has only increased by 3% and 2.5%, which shows that real curves revenue growth is significantly lower than A&R and Sealand. And then the so what comes into it. Well, why do I care about those numbers? Well, OK, A&R and Sealand are different countries, but they are both publicly owned rail companies and they're experiencing positive growth in revenue. So maybe the fact that Railco doesn't have an online ticketing system or is losing revenue as a result of people giving their fraudulent or not collecting tickets, therefore not having tickets or fraudulently riding the trains is a reason why the revenue growth is significantly lower. Uh, I would then probably have a look at average price per ticket. Um, a and R and Sealand are quite nicely sort of op opposite. So Sealand is the first one that jumps out to me. Um, from 2014 to 2015, they had a price reduction. So they're actually reducing their prices by around 2.3%, and then the year after that by 4.8%. Wow! So they're able to reduce their ticket prices, which is often unheard of. Sealand reduced its prices, which actually then saw an increase in its revenue by 5 and 8% respectively, showing some price elasticity of demand, which is a brilliant concept which you can take from your further and previous studies. So therefore, if they've reduced the actual price of per ticket, more people are traveling on a train, which leads to overall revenues increasing. So it shows that real travel is an elastic term, or an elastic price uh, sensitive individual product or service. So what you might take from that is if you were Real Co's board of directors is to look at whether you could reduce the price of your tickets to get more people riding your trains, which would overall lead to increasing revenue. However, Real Co haven't taken that. They have increased their individual um, train ticket prices. So they've increased them by 7.1 and 8.3% respectively. And their revenue has only increased by 2.5%. And you would have expected a yield to increasing significantly more than that. A&R, interestingly, didn't change the rail ticket price, uh, but they did increase it by 4.9% the year after. 
sector. And that might be as a result of their investment in online ticketing in 2015. I would like to look at operating profit margin. Again, how does that compare? Uh, operating profit margin is a very good performance indicator. It shows essentially how good a business is at gaining profit or making profit from their core operations, hence the term operating profit margin. So given it is a real industry organization, they are looking for every single um, pound or they're actually using dollars for every bill and dollar how much profit do we make by simply being a rail operator and then we look at the administrative costs and other costs after that um, and if we look from 2014 2015 and 2016 we can see that there has been a significant reduction for rail curve it is a relatively healthy profit margin so you're still using your evaluation mindset so it's not all doom and gloom, 25.9% are positive, but the margin has eroded by over 8% between 2014 and 2015. That's not good. Um, it's certainly not good performance indicator to have erosion of operating profit margin. Uh, so what, Alex? Why do I care that it's eroded? Well, I care, and the reason it could be is probably as a result of poor cost control, because they've had an increase in revenue of 2.5%, so therefore, their operating costs must have increased in a higher proportion or a higher relative proportion per ticket. It's not good performance by rail curve. Uh, A&R in the same period, the margin has increased by 11%. So they've gone from being not massively profitable, 19.8%, all the way up to 31.5%. And I'd be thinking, well, hang on a minute. If a company which is similar to ours in a neighboring country can manage to increase their operating profit margin, therefore squeeze out more profit per, per dollar of revenue, why is ours increasing? And then we move on to Sealand. Again, they've had an increase in their margin of 8%, which is a good positive key performance indicator for them, and therefore just consolidates my assertion, my evaluation, that Railco's relative performance to its what say competitors, but they are competitive to some extent, or comparable organizations is certainly not the trend. Moving on, operating cost per kilometer was the next KPI that I looked at in terms of performance. ANR, uh, Railcut, and Beeland, now we're using these made up dollars, I do apologize, these Beeland dollars, so they are relative for each country, so we don't need to overthink it in terms of uh, foreign exchange or anything like that, we'll try and keep it simple. Railcurve's cost control seems to be a major weakness. Where both A&R and Sealand have reduced operating costs per kilometre, they've increased by nearly 15% for the period of 2014 to 2016, illustrating that Railcurve have a significant cost control issue. Uh, a couple more to go through. So the percentage of trains on time, and I do this one, or I looked at this one because it links quite nicely back to the customer satisfaction. Um, percentage of trains on time. Sealand have managed to either have no movement or an improvement. A&R have had no, no movement or an improvement of 5%, so significant improvement. And there has been a steady decrease in key customer satisfaction criteria, while both A&R and Sealand have made improvements. Uh, there's a nice spelling mistake for anybody who's got the eagle eye there. Should say improvements. Staff turnover. Um, wow. So we've seen that Rilke staff turnover is the highest out of its comparables. So a and and Sealand have lower. Sealand has significantly lower and has been improving um, from 2014 to 2016. Uh, A&R's has varied with a slight improvement. In 2016, staff turnover is more than double than Sealand's, uh, ranging comparable of 8% to 17%. High staff turnover is symbolic of dissatisfaction, poor motivation, which leads to poor customer satisfaction and more dissatisfaction. It is a vicious, vicious cycle. So what we've done there is, um, is a significant amount of analysis. And I'm just going to flip back to that question, actually. So evaluate the implications and findings of the passenger survey result. And so you've done the first part and the second part in the report, you have actually um, looked at the performance of Railco compared to two comparable organizations. Because it's in a report format, you genuinely 
uh, need to write the term report to, from, dear subject. So there's the beginning of your report. And then you want to go through with the subheadings which we've given as we've gone through. So you want to go through to the headings like these headings, so overall customer satisfaction and so forth. And then headings from your competitor analysis of revenue and so on from there. Um, I might just pause for a second actually and see if there's anything going on in the question panel. And then I'm going to talk about the marking guide for just two A. Brilliant. So from the question panel, I can see that people are um, are very much on board with the understanding of what they were doing there. There's many of you talking about this relative performance increase. So the revenue increase being not as good um, as the price per ticket increase. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting that nobody mentioned anything about price elasticity, but it, that's probably the type of things that a prize winner might throw into their answer. And now you'll probably think of it. So imagine if you could get a question um, about relative increases and decreases in price and demand. Throwing terms in like price elasticity really shows that you're thinking from a very high strategic level. Uh, I've got uh, a Yolanda talking here about competitive advantages, which is fantastic. Um, their e-business strategy and online ticket systems of A&R and Sealand. Some really good terminology there, Yolanda. Very, very good. Thank you very much. Just reading a few more. Jill, uh, or Gil, Gil Cossa, thank you very much. You're also taking into consideration populations and how that might affect it, and you're linking that back into performance. There isn't um, a one size fits all for this requirement. Um, you can use your professional judgment on what you believe is an appropriate performance measurement and analysis tool. So I used, you know, revenue increases, decreases, operating costs and profit percentages and as customer satisfaction. Um, but you could use other ones. There was a lot of information there. And this is where your time management comes into it. Uh, 12 marks for part A plus two professional marks. So if I do 14 times 1.8, so only 25.2 minutes. So we'll just round that down to 25 minutes. I'm hoping you can all empathize with me that we could easily spend three hours doing that question because we do love doing the numbers. We're like, oh, brilliant. We get to do some analysis. We get to do some really technical stuff. But actually, you don't get very many marks for doing any numbers. The real value is getting through this requirement in 25 minutes. So if I were you, I would spend a quick amount of time when planning this, doing the numbers, and then using the structure of the exhibit to flow through your report. See, I really like that one. Very honest of you as well. I take an hour and a half to do my reading and planning. How can I overcome the simple answer? And it's uh, it's not a sexy answer. It is you've got to realistically keep practicing your reading. Um, I appreciate that English might not be your first language. I'm not going to assume it isn't, but I know from teaching around the world that it is a significant barrier for this exam. Many students from different parts of the world, whether it's Pakistan or whether it's in the Middle East, really do struggle because of the reading. And I can tell you from my own experience, the more practice you do with this type of exam, the more um, intuitive your reading and planning skills become, and as a result of that, the time frame in which you do it does cut down. Oh, there's a good one, Sonika. Yeah. Um, can lost time injuries to staff? To yeah. So if I was getting hurt at work, which I don't, I know I'm in a, a nice office, I'm, I'm not getting hurt at work. Um, I wouldn't be happy. So, yeah, if you were continuously seeing more staff injuries, that is also a, a correlation or, or maybe a, a causation as to why staff turnover are variable. That would be more than relevant to pick up marks. So thank you very much.
Uh, I'm now going to have a look at the marking sort of criteria, or I don't want to necessarily call it a matrix, but it's uh, the marking guide. Uh, and keep using the question panel, guys. So please keep using it. It's always really useful. Uh, I'm going to pop it back to the side of the screen. So 12 marks available, one mark for each relevant point supported by relevant calculations. Wow. So that's a nice, short, punchy report with 12 quick points, always understanding that you need to write so what and you would fly through. I would hazard to say that students did and would and have scored very well on this requirement to it. Analysis, if we just take you know, a step back and we look at how we're gonna get this analysis point, um, you would get no marks if you failed to select appropriate metrics or consider or analyze any information carefully. Um, and you would get no marks if you did limited evaluation or calculations. You get half a mark um, if you are able to select appropriate calculations related to the customer survey results, but you didn't then. So, however, there is only some evidence of reflection from these calculations. So you don't get a lot of marks for just using the numbers. As we progress through, you get one mark and then you get a little bit more. So you get two marks. Let's focus on the good ones, where we're actually going to be aiming to. The candidates demonstrated sound evaluation of high levels of reflection on the consideration of the calculations. So with that being said, this is the stuff that you're writing in the question panel where you're talking about the number, but from a consideration. You're looking at the, the reasons why revenue has increased. You're talking about things like the comparison between Sealand and ANR. And with that, you'll get at least, well, you'll get the two marks for your analysis. I'm just going to take a bit of breath. I'm just going to uh, pause for a second. Um, not actually pause, but just bear me one second. And now we're going to look at the second part, question two. So Alex has asked you to draft a letter um, to the chairman of Realco Trust Board. So you want in your answer plan to note that it is going to be a letter. Uh, you would address that to the Realco Trust Board. You would most likely just grab an address. So, you know, you can just put Beeland and then put a date because letters have a date. Now, in your exam, you can put the date of the exam. So that's a bit of administration for you. Put the date of the exam, which is the 3rd of December, 2019 um, and then you want to start with an appropriate structure um, so you will start with dear chairman so that's how you start a letter um, the following in our report uh, or is our report on the effectiveness of internal controls of Rilke based on the evidence I have been able to collect and analyze now that doesn't have to be everything you write that is just a nice opener and you would get credit within your professional capacity for doing so. It doesn't have to copy word by word, it can be words to the effect. And as a marker, I've been looking for this letter format. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get you guys now to have a look for the types of things that you would put in your answer plan. So I'm looking for you to review the effectiveness of the internal controls of Realco using evidence from the minutes of the latest board meeting and so remember, draw a dash through that, any other substitutable sources and justify that the chief executive officer of Railco is filling in their fiduciary duties. Eight marks uh, plus two would be 10. That would be 18 minutes in your real exam. I'm going to give you five minutes and I'm going to flip back to my annotated uh, requirement so you can see that on screen, uh, which is luckily <laughs> nowhere to be seen. Here it is. And you want to be doing that by going through exhibit four. So I'm going to give you five minutes. Uh, have a read through exhibit four as well. Um, and then we can take it from there.
So for those who are now looking, this is exhibit four, board meeting minutes, and you're going down here and you're essentially looking for some of the negative implications that the, um, that the chief executive officer and some of his assertions that are incorrect. Yes, some good ones there. Uh, Furkan, you absolute superstar. You've got some great ones in there already. So, you know, people not paying, that's an internal control problem. Lack of staff training, that's an internal control problem. No barriers to get into the trains again. Um, so, yeah, fantastic insight, guys. Keep them coming. Don't let Furkan take all of the uh, all of the credit. Although, you know, why not? You're doing a good job. All right then, guys, I'm going to have to do a bit of a walkthrough now. So I'm just going to uh, ooh, let's show these questions as well because people are throwing in there. So Furkan's done well. Aisha, you, I always rely on you guys. You're doing some really good stuff here. So uh, the chairman's perception of the customers that do not understand value for money, yeah, it's not a good perception. This is a flaw in his, in his understanding. Um, yeah, the purpose of a public sector organisation is value for money. Uh, also, the... the, the Chief execs understanding regarding online ticketing and, and not implementing this. Um, what else have we got here? Yeah, I usually talk again about fiduciary duty. Um, Hussein Mahmoud, you're talking also about fraud by customers. That's an internal control issue. So you are pulling out the right things out of the exhibit, which is very, very positive. Oh, I love that one, Furkan. I'm going to point out, I mean, you are, you are really good. You must have read Exhibit 4 already. Uh, the Chief Executive Officer's attitude towards or response to the problems of passengers um, is, is, is significantly not appropriate. Um, so. So, the chief exec's attitude, yeah, lots of people have mentioned that. So, what we've got to be careful here now is that we don't overlap too many of the requirements. So, just to make sure that we are answering the question in, 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 its, um, in its appropriate form, we are looking for internal control issues to start with. So, we can find them throughout and we're aware of many of them others and we can do that from different exhibits and we are also going to comment on the chief executive's failure in his fiduciary duty. So, I'm going to have a read uh, through the exhibit four. What is this? It's board meeting minutes and I'm going to pull out a few bits. So, um, the chairman's opening statement, Henrik, uh, the newly appointed chairman, um, uh, has requested that the NAA is under ticket review. It's giving his full support. Uh, John Rose, uh, the current chief executive, has fully endorsed the chairman's comments. Fantastic. So, you know, we've got a little bit of a taste there. Uh, the chief executive report on the customer service uh, results. So, the chairman has 
opened the discussion with the statement that he's disappointed with the latest customer satisfaction results and asked the chief executive to present an overview of the key outcomes of the latest customer service results. So in the blue, uh, the primary focus of the presentation was that Railco failed to meet a number of key PIs, key performance measures, should I say, set by the trust board. Um, the chief exec says, you know, it's still very high, 87%, so that's interesting to know. And then talks about 2002, which was 14 years ago in terms of the case study, um, that customer satisfaction was less than 65%. Um, and this is a significant achievement that they've increased. It. Okay, that's maybe a fair comment, but I don't know whether it's, it's, it's a good assertion yet. Uh, punctuality has increased, so that's a positive as well. Um, and what else have we got in there? He stated that he believes that the target growth for punctuality set by the trust board was unachievable and therefore should be ignored. Wow. So he's saying that the trust board setting targets that should be ignored. This is a senior individual within the organization, the chief executive, who's set there to manage the organization from a senior point of view, who's saying that the oversight body, the, the oversight board, uh, their targets should be ignored. That's not very professional fiduciary behavior. Uh, keep moving forward. The chairman raised the concern that customer perception of value for money for tickets is declining. And we move into the highlight part. The, uh, the chief executive states that there is strongly believes that the majority of customers do not understand the concept of value for money. And therefore, this measure was flawed. Wow. So that's the managing director, the chief exec, one for the same term, saying that his own customers do not understand value for money. Well, then why on earth? would you have them as customers? Surely, surely that is a, a big problem within the organization, but doesn't necessarily relate directly to requirement 2B. So we've got to be careful that it might relate to a later requirement. Uh, exhibit four, audit and risk committee reports by the chair. Evidence suggests that more passengers are traveling on the rail car network without ticket barriers. There's an internal control problem. Approximately 40% of rail car stations do not have operating ticket barriers. Wow, um, that's painful. So you're saying that your train stations for 40% of your, of your train stations don't have barriers. There's an internal control failing. I want to see that in your answer. Um, as we move forward, the chief executive disagrees Wow, okay, so what is he disagreeing with? Let's just be concise. Um, so the chair, Mr. Axes, referred to the recent meeting that he had with Jasper, the asset management director, in which they had discussed the installation of ticket barriers at more of real coast stations to prevent customer fraud. So they've got executive directors who operationally want to implement this. The finance director was asked to present an analysis of the impact of fraud on real coast revenues at the next board meeting. Okay, fair enough, so they're filling out the scenario. The chief executive disagreed that this was a significant risk to the rail car and that the cost of installation of the ticket barriers would far outweigh the benefit. So also stated that most customer fraud was unpreventable and this measure would be merely creating more customer dissatisfaction. Wow. So I don't think that that's an internal control issue, but it could necessarily be something that we'd relate to look at in maybe requirement three. Um, but also, you know, it's a bad perception, it's a bad attitude of the chief executive officer. Uh, the safety and health uh, executive committee, oh, sorry, the safety and health uh, committee, so this is made up of non-executive, should I say. Uh, the chair is Kim Lunn. Many of you have talked about this, so very insightful. You've seen that there's been an increase in the number of injuries reported uh, by Railcut in the last year. Um, this is definitely going to affect uh, staff turnover, so that's another instance. So that's um, a, an internal control issue, staff and safety problems. Uh, it then goes on to say that they have noted that there has been a lack of investment in the training of staff in the last three years, and this has affected staff morale. Wow, so that's not a good thing either. Um, the chief executive stated that although the HR director was not a board member, uh, his own opinion was that training levels were satisfactory and that there was no evidence to suggest that staff morale is low. Well, that's a contradiction in its terms, and that's wrong. The, the chief exec seems completely warped because there is evidence that staff morale is low because there is high staff turnover. He pointed to the evidence that customer satisfaction reports indicated that an annual growth in satisfaction levels um, in relation to staff helpfulness and attitude 
they, they aren't necessarily you know correlated you could say that having good staff who was very helpful might just be the fact that they're good people and they work hard that's not necessarily related to the staff morale the section which relates to in other business, uh, the IT director made a short presentation on the use of an online booking system by rail businesses. Evidence suggests that they had a positive impact upon revenue growth and customer satisfaction in all of these businesses. The chief executive expressed um, his concerns that investment in an online booking facility was a knee-jerk reaction um, to the current challenges to rail curve. Again, it's not, it's not really foresight. He's not actually living the vision of Railco, which is you know, to embrace technology. Uh, section two, the chairman informed the board that the HR director was currently in a meeting with the head of Beeland's Rail Work Workers Union to discuss the recent demands for above inflation rate pay increases for workers. In green now, the chairman expressed concerns that his development or this development as any threat of a strike action could seriously be damaging to the public's perception of Railco. The chief executive then goes on to state that this um, Railco would take a firm stand against any pressure from this unions from an increased staff pay. And the last point, and we'll move on to my answer plan now, uh, his opinion was that the media is responsible for stirring up the interest in the unions and that the media were not an important stakeholder. Okay, wow. So, just to reiterate the requirement itself, review the effectiveness of the internal controls of Railco using evidence from the minutes and the latest Railco board meeting and any other suitable sources uh, and justify that the chief executive of Railco is failing in their fiduciary duty. So here we go. Here's some internal control problems. Passengers without tickets. This is a significant business risk. If it's not acted upon by the board, uh, it could cause you know, massive problems for the business. It's probably a reason why their revenues are down. In fact, it is a reason why their revenues are, um, are not as high as expected. They're increasing, but not as by the percentage of the price of in ticket increased. 40% of stations do not have ticket barriers. This could seriously damage the revenue. Yes, it does. Uh, another internal control issue, lack of investment in online booking and other training operators. Uh, so other, sorry, online, online bookings. Other train operators offer this facility. There is a lack of IT investment and development, which is hampering long-term performance. Staff safety and training. Many of you mentioned this in the question panel, so thank you very much. There is increased injuries in rail curve. Beeland's head of safety um, has expressed a concern, and Kim Lung and NED noted a lack of investment in staff training in the last three years. Um, another internal control which is pulled out is a, a poor pay structure, because poor, poorly paid staff are dissatisfied. This can lead to trade union action, which was alluded to in the last paragraph, Exhibit 4. Um, high staff turnover is seen throughout the exhibits, and this could be as a result of weak human resource policies. If we move into the next part of Section 2B, and we talk about the Chief Executive John Rose and their failings in the fiduciary duties. Um, his response to the ticket barriers and frauds being unpreventable this shows a lack of understanding of key internal control weaknesses. This is poor judgment in terms of a cost benefit as the barriers appeared unsubstantiated. Quite simply saying it was a knee jerk reaction um, is not good enough. Comments with no evidence uh, that the staff morale is low. That was outright incorrect. Staff turnover has increased on a yearly basis. There is a reluctance from John to invest in technology. So a lack of investment in online ticket facilities could prove seriously damaging to Railco. It certainly will, considering Sealand and ANR have both invested in this already. And then we've seen from the newspaper report that customers are choosing other modes of transport, like the car or potentially using the bus services, which again, you can link back to revenue and the potential issues for revenue lack of growth. His attitude towards the trade unions is inappropriate and could be counterproductive. Strike actions could be seriously negative to the rail company. 
Um, and I know full well that when a train strikes, it causes no end of upheavals. And his comment on the media, is calling it an unimportant stakeholder, this is outright incorrect. Um, think of the reputational risk caused to the organization. It simply is not appropriate to say that the media are an unimportant stakeholder. They are a significant stakeholder with a high level of interest in Railco, given they're already writing about it in their local and, and media newspaper outlets. Um, they could cause a significant downward trend and continue to push the perception of the business into a negative area. Now, the requirement actually asks this for be, to be a letter, and it also wants you to consider um, the overall structure. So you want to then come up with a conclusion, close off your letter with a yours sincerely, and given that you are an assistant auditor of the NAA. Now, what I'd like you to do now in the question panel, and I'm going to give you five minutes to do this. If you have one, I'm going to review that panel as well. I would like you to write a conclusion based on question 2B. So looking at the effectiveness of the internal controls, so my first line would probably be a conclusion on the overall effectiveness. So are they effective, are they not effective? Back that up with a summary of some of the evidence from the case. So for example, the fact that they lack ticket barriers and they haven't invested in technology. And then I would also conclude on the chief executive officer and failing in his fiduciary duty. So I would like to see you guys, I know that some of you are very engaging in this, so please do draft up a, a quick plan for your conclusion. I'd love to see what you come up with. And I will re-engage and talk um, back in the next five minutes. So write up your conclusion into the answer panel or into the question panel. I'm going to have a little look now as well because there's some, some stuff flying in, which is fantastic. I think I was just looking for a few more conclusions in there. 
um, whereby you would show me that you can summarise the overall um, problems with the case. So we're looking at the issues with internal controls and then we're looking at the issues with the chief exec. Ah, Hassan, very good. Fantastic. Yeah, Hassan, I hope you don't mind me reading this one out. Overall, my conclusion is the chief executive officer shows failure in the fiduciary duties towards its principles as he doesn't seem, oh, sorry, just jumped up, as he doesn't seem to properly understand uh, the issues and impacting the growth of real care on it, as having impacting the growth on real care. Uh, this would have a negative impact in the coming years. Thank you. Oh, they're all flooding in now. Uh, Furkan, Sonika, Nasir. Uh, yeah, great stuff. Aisha, I'll get to that in a minute. Furkan, I like that one. So the internal controls in Railco is not up to the market, falls short in preventing fraud and accepting the dynamic change required for the survival of the business. The chief executive officer is not open to suggestions and his hostile behaviour towards unions is also very concerning, whereas the lack of interest in investment in an online system is contradictory to the company's objective itself. Wow, I like that, Furkan. Yeah, fantastic. It looks like they should really be employing you as an assistant auditor at NAA. Um, Sonika. Let's have a look what we've got there. Thank you. Uh, yep, yeah, so thus this seems the major weaknesses and in internal controls of Railco, the chief executive officer, uh, who is also the one of the responsible parties for the control environment, nice use of terminology, Sonika, uh, is not concerned about the major business risks faced by the company. The chief executive has not paid enough attention and taken action plan to resolve the problems of the employees and customers. Thank you. Messiah, uh, let's have a read through yours. The chief executive is not doing a great job as he lacks communication with the major stakeholders. I'd just be careful of using phrases like great job, although it's perfectly fine for me and you to talk about it. I would expect a slightly more professional turn. And I know this is just a plan, so we're not going to be too, dis too, too discriminatory. I think that's fine. But I would maybe sort of increase that to uh, the chief executive officer is is lacking in their ability to to meet the the needs of the major stakeholders i'd, I'd keep away from sort of jovial terms like great job but the rest of it's perfectly right uh, he wants to run the organization with their own perspective and not in the interests of real coast public sector organizations and the major stakeholder which is the taxpayers uh, Abdul Qadir, lovely start to your conclusion. So I hope this letter addresses the effectiveness of internal controls, including a number of serious internal controls, such as a lack of ticket barriers, chief executive officer refusal, uh, that such internal control problems like barriers and tickets are not as significant and his assumptions that the media is not a significant stakeholder. It will also include the chief executive failure to behave professionally and breaching their fiduciary duties to the trustees of real court. Fantastic. Uh, Gil Corsa, lovely, lovely conclusion. Uh, internal controls are ineffective with a significant deficiency in internal controls. And you've brought in some of the extract. 40% of train stations with no ticket barriers is significant to the business and can threaten the businesses are going concerned. Nice. So you've obviously done some auditing papers before and you're using good terminology from your prior studies. So keep that up. Uh, a lack of training and an increase in injuries brings bad publicity and can impact the company's reputation and increase costs through. I can't read that word. I do apologize. Cheers, Gil. Uh, and uh, Nushad, thank you very much. The chief executive officer's overall understanding lacks in various areas of operation, IT and internal controls, which is an alarming situation of real care as a chief executive officer responsible for in the business. The chairman needs to consider the appropriate action to resolve this issue. Yours sincerely, Nushad. 
Thank you very much. Right, so I'm going to now just sort of go back through this requirement because it is a considerably sized one. And then I'm going to take some more questions. And I will address your question, Aisha, because I think this might help as we go along. See, Aisha's question, I'm going to paraphrase if you don't mind, and I really do value your insight, so I will address it. She said that she feels like we're dupl duplicating points. Um, so again, you know, I completely respect that uh, where we talk in part A and part B. And again, if I've misinterpreted your question, let me know. So I'm understanding your question saying that in part A, we're talking about things like customer satisfaction, IT, ticket barriers. And then we're also talking about them in part B. The key difference, Aisha, and hopefully I'll get us back on track, is the way in which you address them and, and how we conclude as a result of these observations and evaluations. So if I just go back to the beginning of this and I'll walk through it more so, um, and I'll do you know what I might do? I might just edit it so we've just got the, the answer plans next to each other. So I'm just going to pause my screen for one second, so bear with me. Um, and I'm just going to remove the exhibits so it's easier to condense it. So if I hide them and we go back to the beginning where we get the requirement A and requirement B lined up. Bear me one second. Got to love PowerPoint. Sometimes it's not the easiest thing to work with. Um, and they can go here. And I'm back in the room, so let's just walk through this. We've got 10 minutes left, so this will probably take us nicely towards the end of the evening. Um, and thank you, everyone, for your engagement. It's been a really good night, and I hope you've enjoyed it. I know I enjoyed the Kahoot and, and all the engagement within the question panel. Let's see if we can make sure that everybody finishes on a similar page and we've got clarity. So question two, um, part A, evaluate the implications of the findings of the passenger survey results and review the actual and relative performance. So with that, oh, well, it would work. <laughs> there we go. With that, we're looking at these particular numbers. Oh, hang on a minute. I don't know what's going on there. I want to close that. Um, let's go back to this. Hopefully it's still working. Bear me one second. I just want to make sure we're still in the. Uh, yeah. So for some reason it stopped. Uh, people can see you. We'll turn that off. <laughs> um, right. Just to check, I had a little bit of an IT um, bamboozle there, and we'll get back in. That's probably me messing around with the PowerPoint. Um, we're all ready to go. So. Evaluate the implications and findings of the passenger survey results. So this is where we're significantly concerned with the passenger survey results. And our answer wants to comment on them. So it's commenting on the movement, and then it goes on to discuss um, how and why that's happened. So overall customer satisfaction has 87%. It's still high, but the trend needs reversing. And we work our way through each one of them, pair the extract from the passenger survey results. Part A, the second part is looking at competitor performance analysis, and this is where we're trying to link this in a comparison to A&R and sealant. So what we're really concerned our answer here is how is Railco getting on compared to its two biggest comparative organisations? So is it doing well compared to sealant, and is it doing well compared to A&R? And the overall residing or resounding factor is it's not. It's got poor revenue growth, it's got an increasing average price per ticket, its operating profit margins are eroding, its cost per kilometre is increasing, its trains are getting slower and its staff turnover is high. So this is where we're using the exhibit specifically to do some analysis. In the next part here, this letter is more concerned with reviewing the effectiveness of the internal controls and draws from wider expertise. So the previous exhibits, so exhibit one, two, three, and then also exhibit four. So this is where we are now more concerned with the specificness and the qualitative issues, such as the passengers without ticket barriers, lack of investment of online booking, staff safety and training and pay structure, and then we go into causing, uh, bringing the, to the attention to the chairman of the trust board that there is a significant issue with the fiduciary responsibilities 
of the actual ch um, chief executive officer. Many of you did really well at summarising this, and I hope you can see that John Rose is failing in his fiduciary duties. Aisha, I hope you saw that as well, and I hope we didn't lose you too early. So there is a, a problem with John's response in terms of the ticket barriers. It is considerably inappropriate and quite an assertion to think that, you know, oh, we don't need them. You do. Um, his reluctance to invest in technology is, again, a breach of his fiduciary duty because it's not acting in the best interests of all the shareholders, stakeholders, taxpayers, investors. Um, the comment on there is no evidence of staff morale is a complete oversight. He's probably not even looked at the, the passenger survey results and the performance analysis. And therefore, this comment, and we're coming at from the angle of what the chief executive has said, is inappropriate. That's where we're talking about staff turnover being an inappropriate. We're bringing it back in, but we're not talking about it as a performance measure. We're talking about it in terms of John not understanding or not seeing this metric. Attitude towards unions and media. I mean, you could even group those together if you want. They're both inappropriate. They're both significant stakeholders, and therefore John is breaching his fiduciary responsibility. Hopefully that's helped a little bit. Um, and I'm going to now just spend a second or two minutes or two talking about the marking guide. So part B was only worth eight marks. So you've got to get the letter format, okay? And you get up to two marks for each internal control identified and evaluated, up to a maximum of six marks. So it's not necessarily equally weighted. A further four marks uh, to justify with evidence why the chief executive officer should be removed, which is effectively what it was asking. You've actually got a, a 10 marks available for an eight mark technical requirement. So you could struggle here, and sometimes students do this, where they spend too long on a requirement and they can't score more than the maximum mark allocation. So you've got eight technical marks plus two for scepticism, so 10 in totality. Although there are 12 available, you can only get 12. Uh, so you can only get 10, not 12. Scepticism is to be questioning of the opinions and assertions, and you would really do very well if you were to talk about the actual assertions of the chief executive officer. So if we just walk through each one of these, uh, you score no marks if the candidate has failed to demonstrate uh, any scepticism of internal controls or the opinions and assertions made by the chief executive officer. So if you don't talk about them, you don't get any marks. The candidate demonstrates no evaluation and doesn't challenge the chief executive officer, you're going to get nothing. Whereas on the opposite end of the spectrum, where you're going to get two marks for scepticism, you will have strongly question the opinions and assertions of the chief executive officer, and these will be valid and based upon the evidence in the case. The candidate challenges the opinions of the chief executive officer in a professional manner and in a justified manner, and therefore the use of turn and language, um, like I illustrated earlier, of more professional language when challenging it is extremely important. This draws me quite nicely towards the end. Now, what I'm going to do is, while I've still got this page open, in fact, I think I might have one that says the questions, which is quite aptly timed, I'm going to look at the question panel now and see if anybody else has thrown anything in there. And thank you very much if you have. Oh, Aisha, thank you very much. She's, <laughs> yay, is, is how I'm going to actually say that. Got it. Really nice of you, thank you. No, I, I would always try to address any concerns of students being confused, particularly given the, the size of that question. Uh, I think it's the biggest one in this exam, and it is quite a, 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 a tricky one. Uh, so we are coming towards the end, but we do have a couple of minutes to go, so I don't want to cut short. Um, so please do question anything in the actual question panel. Um, Kennedy's asking about a WhatsApp group. I'm not able to set that up given there's GDPR restrictions, um, but if you guys want to take it upon yourselves, please do. Um, Yolanda, thank you very much for your feedback. I appreciate that, and I look forward to speaking to you tomorrow. Um, they put a request in for a Kahoot. I mean, I'd be interested to know, does everybody want a Kahoot, or are there more people interested in a Kahoot than not? I'm more than willing to make another one.
Utawi, uh, lovely name, I hope I've said that right. You're talking about the planning time, the reading and planning time. So you said we would spend 40 to 60 minutes reading and understand the case. How do we do this? At the start of the exam or while tackling the requirements by dividing the time? I would heavily advocate that you should do it as you go along at the beginning of the exam. So that first 40 minutes, you want to be reading the requirements, reading the scenario, and trying to find the parts of the exhibits that match up to the requirements. That will guide you. Hopefully, uh, Itawi, that's answered your question. Oh, Bill, our lovely feedback. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate that. It's, you know, it's building your confidence. That's what I'm here for. Um, yes, all right, we can do another Kahoot. I'll put that in it. I'll make one tomorrow and I'll make sure it's ready for the evening. Um, and I'll try and fit it in an appropriate time so we can have some fun. Uh, Hassan's asking a little bit more about professional marks, so I'm more than happy to do some more work on that over the next three days. I intend to anyway, so I'm sure you're not the only one thinking that. Hi, Kennedy. I'm not sure if you were on yesterday's call. Uh, Kennedy's asking, is it acceptable to use more than one model in one requirement? Um, and I, I'm being really honest with you here. Uh, models are useful. But not necessary. Use the model if you are confident that it needs it, but don't just throw a model in or more than one model because you will be forcing it. So if you weren't on this, oh, I do think you were. Um, try not to get too wet up on models, although they're useful from an academic understanding and knowledge base, they aren't necessarily the most appropriate way of answering a professional question. John, I'm more than, in fact, I'm going to write that one down. John's asking for a little bit on internal controls. And um, I, might, I might actually, in fact, I will do a little bit on internal controls. I'll look and see if it fits tomorrow. So uh, if it does, I'll amend my presentation and uh, you'll get the amended version as well. And um, we can add that as well. So yeah, John, internal controls, I will do something for you guys on that. And if there's any other specific requests, I'll try and fit it in. Uh, Erica Noon, worry, you're allowed to work, bless. That's exactly what we want of our students. Thank you for being so committed, uh, working and studying. Sharice, you're all the way in Jamaica. You're 10 hours ahead. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I genuinely aren't sure when this is produced when it's produced um, in a video. Um, I, I don't deal with the administration side of things. So I don't know when it's going to be ready on a video. Aisha, that's fine. You know, you've, you've got a plan in place. So it takes you slightly longer to do the reading, but you sound like you've got it. You know, how can you maximize your time? Take the question requirement marking allocation times it 1.8 and absolutely stick to it. Right, and guys, it looks like we're coming towards the end. Uh, Gil, just your last one. How do I develop better communication? Which verbs? Um, I'm, there is um, probably a lot could be said about this. I would focus on key structures. So understanding what a brief looks like, a brief report looks like, or a look, looks what a memo looks like, uh, a letter, and then you will certainly score well in your communication marks. Uh, in terms of key verbs, it depends on the requirement. So it could be that you just continue to practice and have a little look at some of the model answers on the ACCA's website. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we are now at the end of the session. I hope you all have a lovely evening, afternoon or morning, depending on where you are in the world. And I look forward to seeing or speaking with you all tomorrow. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.